Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. So in the past, you all have heard my stories how I started in tech startups, how a guy named Mark Monroe reached out to me while I was looking for a down the army. While well, today we have the one and only Mark Monroe on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Mark, thanks for being here today. Oh, man. It's been, what is this, been years in the making? It's been a while, yeah, yeah. Um, so softball question for you. What do you do to take care of yourself, like mentally, physically, whatever taking care of yourself is? Lots of video games, lots of walks. Uh, I mean, of course, spending time with my wife, who's like my champion. Uh, of course, just sleep. Because <laughs> I think that a lot of founders miss out on sleep. Because everyone's not Elon Musk, right? A absolutely not. Like, you know, how this man like literally goes off of maybe like 30 hours a week on sleep on a 168 hour day. I don't, I couldn't do it. Um, I know, isn't there some, that, some study out there that says, like, if you, if you go like that, you're, you're going to catch, like, dementia or Alzheimer's later on in life? It's very, it's, I can see that, that that's very possible. Like, I think that, like, sometimes I find myself, like, doing 110 hours on a seven-day week, and I know that after pulling a 110-hour week, I'm, mm, nah. So that's, that's a good point. Like, as a founder or entrepreneur, anyone working, like, how do you know? So sometimes you got to push through, right? Yep. Like, how do you know when to push through when, like, okay, I need to give myself a break? Um, it's like anything else, you know, when it's like, you're like, you know, you're, you're overextending yourself, like you feel it, like, you know, every founder or anybody else out there knows that, like, all right, I'm tired, like, and I'm gassed. And I always like one of the things that my wife says, like, when, when you say that you're tired, I listen, like, I don't let that slide. And so it's just more so in the sense of just being in tune to like yourself and not trying to overextend yourself. Um, because when you do that, you make mistakes, <laughs> you make tons of mistakes. You, uh, and then on top of that, it's like, not only did you make the mistake, but then you have to go back. And then on top of that, your health, like your body is not able to fight off things that, you know, normally that you typically fight. So your immune system is compromised. So, you know, the power of sleep is incredible. And next question, what do you, what do you do for fun? Oh man, uh, soccer, basketball, You're still playing soccer, still playing though that like, I've been, I've been kind of like resting my Achilles a little bit. Uh, trying not to get an Achilles injury, but it's just been like a strain. Uh, definitely video games. I'm on Division Two all day, every day. Uh, well, not all day, but like you know, that's my favorite go-to. Uh, and then of course I still watch wrestling <laughs> when I can catch it. So, what's your take on? I think there's been like a lot of layoffs in the gaming industry. What's your take on that? Oh, this I was the just, cycle <laughs> of that, or I was just I was just talking to I think it was Tom Hammer on LinkedIn. Uh, so shout outs to Tom Hammer if you're watching this from A16Z. Um, he was talking about this where we were talking about like layoffs from EA, and uh, I think it was Take Two Interactive. Um, I think that it's a rolling effect. I think it's a rolling effect. I mean, you had in the pandemic where a lot of these companies had to massively hire due to the fact that we were seeing a totally different new, new normal. Not everybody was at the office. You needed redundancies. You, need to, you needed all those things. But now, like, pandemic is over. Uh, the, the landscape has changed. Uh, operational expenses don't need to be that high. Uh, so essentially, you got to cut back on CapEx spending. Uh, you got to get you know, wages under control where you once saw during the pandemic, people who, were, who would normally get paid 175 are getting paid 250 uh, a year. And so those are the things that we saw given that inflation was high, cost of capital was high. So of course, companies need to really back in. And, you know, I think that, you know, the gaming industry is facing that also. We saw a lot of games, a lot of game studios out there that really underperformed um, now that people are back outside. So of course, it's like you got to cut back. There's all this like workers being unrealistic as far as the seller expectations. Like you said, it used to be 250. And now, I mean, you would think if you get paid 250, you see everyone get, getting laid off, you got laid off, and you want the same 250. Like, okay, like, <laughs> like, read, like read the market, right? Read the room. Or, or am I wrong? Or no, for real. Read the market. The market, like, I, you know, I always tell people the market says what you are. You know, so again, it's like you may believe that you should be making 250, but then when you see everybody else in your counterparts, like literally coming down to like, let's say 195 to 215, it's time to read the room as like, okay, hey, you know, you may get that job, but then at the same token, when it comes time for them having to cut back on spending or cut back on operational expenses, you're going to, that overhead cost, you're going to be probably the first yeah. person. Yeah. And obviously, like, we're not saying don't get your value, get your value. Yeah. Get your value. Your value might not be as high as you think it is. Yes. 
And it's also in the sense of like, you know, weathered, weathered expectations and not being over like this overzealous in your expectations. You know, you're still great, but then understand like, you know, climate, sentiment and everything else. Those things also play a role. What is it that the company is willing to spend? What is it that they can afford at this point in time? Yeah. Like people like different over her. Like, I know I think Elon Musk got a lot of criticism. You can't cut all these jobs. Twitter's going to fail. And like, is Twitter still running, right? I mean, it's like, I mean, you might disagree with the politics and stuff they do, but man, yeah. it's still running. You know? It's very much so still running. Um, I think that, you know, with with Twitter, it's kind of like, you know, it kind of makes you ask the question, was Twitter really supposed to be a publicly traded company or yeah. did it grow too fast beyond its control? Like you said, I'm sure that a lot of redundancy. In there was a lot of redundancies that they had to cut back on. They had made a lot of acquisitions that never really panned out that they kind of scrapped. So that was just wasted capital. Mm -hmm. Um, the company wasn't really making you know, like if you look at its earnings growth over a period of time, it wasn't showing growth. It was actually showing significant decline. So yeah, I mean you gotta like you gotta cut. And what's the story I, 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 that you hear like you know Elon Musk had cut down, cut off these servers. They said it'd, be, it'd take a year. He did like in a weekend with two random dudes. Yep. Like what the fuck? Like, are you kidding me right now? No. I mean, like, he's Elon in Musk, startup mode. Is, is he that smart? Like goddamn. It, it, yeah, that's smart. I mean, it's smart, and it also means that you know you, he's taking the necessary execution of what needs to happen. Like you know, that's and that's the thing. It's like some folks still have that startup mindset mm -hmm. where it's like, okay, hey, yeah, I manage a publicly traded company, but at the same token, a lot of tech companies are realizing this. They're running like their departments like startups. Like individual silos are running as startups and look at what happened to companies like Amazon. How would they, how were they able to get massive amounts of scale? It's always day one for them, right? It's always day one. So it's like, they're, they're not like in the sense that they believe that they're too big, that they can't make a move just as like, just quickly. And so Elon Musk is just like, okay, Hey, like we're going back to startup mode. We're, we're a private company now. And this one that I know people realize about Amazon I have a good friend that works at AWS. She's a director or something. Mm -hmm. And she looked it up. She's been there like only seven years. And she's been the longer, like 93% of the company, right? I mean, <laughs> and somehow it works, you know? It does. It does. I mean, um, you and I both know somebody there, Jonathan. Yeah. Um, he does some pretty phenomenal stuff. And, you know, Jonathan is like one of those that, by the way, shout out to Jonathan if he sees this. <laughs> um, but, you know, I remember I used to give him so much shit about him, like literally drinking the Amazon Kool Aid. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but then now you see it, and you see the company in which that has become. Like he's been there since what 2013, 2014. Yeah. And to see the company that it is ten years yeah. later, yeah. just light years like different, but yet at the same token, Amazon's still that company that says that if they step into a space, you look at the uh, you look at the other companies that are in that space, their stock drops like by three percent. Yeah, I, I still say it's gonna be Amazon everything pretty soon. It already is Amazon everything. I think the thing is, it's just that I, I think Amazon has taken somewhat of a different approach now that Andy Jassy is like the, like pretty much the ghost in the shell or the the man behind the machine. Um, but I think that honestly, it's, it's where Jeff Bezos was like more so like in your face, you will know it's coming. Andy Jassy is like kind of like the silent blade that you don't see that's happening. That's getting ready to, that's getting ready to come forth. And, you know, kudos to them. Like, it's very rare to actually get like somebody that's in that succession plan that can literally like pick it up and keep it going. Like what we're seeing with like companies like Apple, Steve Jobs gone, but now Tim Cook yeah. and he's been there for X amount of time. And it's, it's like, don't get me wrong, Apple's still Apple, but it's not the same. Yeah. And so, but to literally have Amazon there and literally not even miss a beat, that's rare. So speaking of Apple, what do you think of this uh, partnership between Apple and uh, open AI? Uh, I think it's good. I think it's good. I mean, though, you know, I would have gone anthropic, but you know. <laughs> so, any any concerns about Elon Musk? Concerns about Apple giving everyone's data to OpenAI or anything like that? That's pretty much like a done deal. Privacy is done anyway. I, I would say that you know, like looking at Apple, Apple, like if you look at you know how Apple has always run, their thing has always been in the mindset of privacy first. I don't see that change. I don't see that mantra change. I mean, Elon Musk, I, I mean, though that, you know, his points are warranted, but I think it might be a little bit misguided and misplaced a little bit. I mean, everything about like, and probably the reason why we see Apple kind of like not always the first to think is because of the fact that they're thinking about privacy. They're thinking about like their, their customer base. Um, they're not thinking about like, okay, hey, we're going to sacrifice these things for growth. That's not how Apple operates. 
So given in the sense that them working with open AI, you know, giving their user base the choice to be able to use those services and to also integrate, that's that's the user's choice. They're right. Um, but no, I, I, don't, I don't see any issues here. So I know recently there's a lot of talk about, you know, Google, Microsoft, like Apple being monopolies. Are they really monopolies or just the government system yeah, going after them? The monopolies, okay. The monopolies. It's just that the legislation hasn't picked, the legislation is too afraid to ultimately go after any of these companies. Like, okay, okay, let I always ask people this running joke. If Google's sitting right here, right, and we're, you have to interrogate them, are you going to interrogate them? Man, that's a good question. Like, are you going to interrogate the person that knows your search history? I guess they're paying <laughs> your search history. Like, My I'm, search history, probably not. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, yo, how do you interrogate a person? And the next day, it's all leaked across the New York Times and CNN and, you know. Or just the fact that they don't even have to leak it. They can oh. just give you the look like, yeah, we know. We, 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 <laughs> ac we, we accidentally, our intern accidentally let this out. And, and, it's, and it's crazy because it's like, we freely gave these companies our data. Like, no, like think about it like back, in, back then when these companies were like really in their golden years, right? Nobody challenged that. Nobody questioned it because of the fact that we were trying to be convenient the first, and... and it was convenient. Like America wanted to be dominant at the dominant tech space that it is. Well, now that you've done that and America has become the dominant tech space of the world, it's like, okay, now you want to put the, that genie back in the bottle. And it's like, how does that happen? Now with AI now coming into the question, now we're going to have, we should be having some serious conversations legislatively. We already saw it play out kind of like with the strikes and you know the SAG and, and Writers Guild. We saw some of those things as it pertains to how AI is supposed to participate in Hollywood activities. Um, we need to have more of those conversations. So it seems like, you know, with AI tech, all the stuff going on, all that stuff's in the year 2100. The government is still in the year 1821, right? Fact. And there's no way the government has any idea how to, you know, legislate this stuff. It's not the fact that I don't think that they know how to legislate it. I think the thing is, is that they're just so deeply embedded into like specific interest groups that do not allow them to. So you're going to have to find individuals that are able to legislate that don't have any type of ties or anything like that to any of these companies. And that literally say, OK, hey, well, you know, forget all this stuff. We're going to have to do it. And I have this feeling that we're going to wait till the very well, I wouldn't say till the very last minute, but I think that we're going to get to a place where it's not going to be the most opportune uh, time where it's going to be like, oh, crap, like, shit, we just shit the bed. <laughs> and now we got to legislate. So let's move to financial fast. So we got an election coming up. Okay. Does it really matter who's in charge of the federal government, state government, or any organization, like, at all? Like, I think in the certain commerce, does it matter who who's running it? As I, far think, as well, I mean, you served our country, so you know, like, it, it, probably does, it may a little bit, but um, I think as it pertains to voters, like people, I always say, like, people vote based upon their interests. And I always believe that it's based upon certain economic, they vote based upon their economic interests versus like, you know, I think that that's really where the ideals are. Um I do believe that it's going to matter as it pertains to like, you know, who you have in specific subsets uh, like, for example, managing treasury, managing, you know, like, obviously we see what's happening legislatively in the sense that have we even passed a spending bill yet? Who knows? It, exactly. Who knows? So like those things matter because of the fact is that you have a federal reserve that's doing X, Y, Z to try to keep things like tempered as it pertains to inflation. But then you have a government that just keeps spending exorbitant dollars. Like, hey, money's not a thing. Like, we still have green for the printing the money out. <laughs> the, the printers ain't ran on green. Ink. We still yeah. have the green ink. So, yeah. I think that at that point, I think it's just more so in the sense that yeah, it does matter. It definitely does matter at who's at leadership, who's at the wheel. Um, and I think that honestly, like this next election, it's really going to determine that as it pertains to who controls the spending, or will we kind of like real in spending or Will spending just get to a place out of control? Like IMF has already said, the International Mon uh, Monetary Fund, they were like, look, y'all need to reel in the spending. You're spending way too much and it's getting ridiculous. So now we got that saying, you know, hey, we need to reel in our spending. You know, other folks have been saying that we need to reel in our spending. But if you have a treasury that's consistently spending and the Fed is trying to cut things or they're trying to hold things so that way we can get things under control, it's kind of like you've you got multiple entities with their hands tied behind their back. Is there an organization, or was the Federal Reserve Bank or uh, Department of Treasury or some 
unknown organization in the U.S. government that has the most impact on the economy that people really don't know about? Um, you know, it depends upon who you talk to. Like, if you talk to a person that's who is on the economic standpoint, they'll definitely easily tell you it's the Treasury and the Federal Reserve. You know, Federal Reserve is ultimately, I would say Federal Reserve because they're supposed to be, you know, completely like, you know, hey, we're not impacted by, you know, either side of the aisle, you know, though that they may have their own individual ideals, whatever. But ultimately, they're, they're not, though that they're appointed, but then at the same token, they have their own mandate. So I would say that it's probably the Federal Reserve. Uh, Treasury, of course, can literally upset the established order of that. So I would say, yeah, it's Treasury and, and Federal Reserve. And most people on the Federal Reserve is an actual part of the federal government, right? Only like a separate entity or something. They're separate. They're separate. They're okay. separate. So like they're they're still federal, but yet at the same token, they're not they're not tied. Like to they don't work other... for the president or Congress or no. like own thing. No, they meet with them and everything else, but yet at the same token, like if Jerome Powell is like he's being interrogated, he's like, okay, I okay, that's your feeling, that's your thought, but I don't work for you. Yeah. <laughs> so like you can give me your suggestions and everything else, and their suggestions, their opinion. But in the grand scheme of things, it's, it's the Federal Reserve. Yeah, so, I could be wrong, but I remember the first first ran for re-election against Clinton. He blamed the federal chairman for losing because the federal chairman at the time didn't didn't raise or didn't lower interest rates or something, and Bush blamed him. For, it can have an impact. For him losing it, election, it, yeah. It can have an impact because it plays it plays towards the sentiment, right? You know, like, and that's why I said like people vote based upon their economic interests. So it plays towards the sentiment. If sentiment is not too hot, then it has a huge impact on who's serving in the current cabinet, but yet at the same token, it may not even be their fault. The person's just doing their job and ultimately like, you know, really economics has nothing to do in certain cases. Like for example, we saw all these tax cuts for, we saw this tax, you know, reduction and everything else for like, you know, in, in tax policy. Well, I mean, given that we saw that it take place, what did that do? That brought inflation. That was the major part that brought inflation alongside with a few other things. Okay, now inflation's here. Now you have a new president that came into office at the same time that we saw inflation rear its ugly head. Now inflation is starting to like slowly come down, but not as fast as everybody wants it. Now everybody's blaming the president that ultimately that is here because of the fact that they see that the treasury is spending, but yet at the same token, he's like, wait a minute, this wasn't my fault. I wasn't even here when this <laughs> happened. Like, you know, so I think that it's over time in like economics over a cycle, we go through economic cycles and there's nothing that you can do about it. They're going to happen. Yeah. So you did a post on X on May 31st where you said global debt was like $350 trillion. So like, <laughs> is it? So that's a lot of damn debt. So that's a lot of debt. Like, can, like, can we ever pay that off? Or can you just, you just cancel it? Do you say like, or do you say, hey, country A owes this country 50 billion, are you 25 billion? And just like, like there's no, I mean, it's like it's mind-boggling. Well, okay, let's put. Let me ask the. Let me ask it in the question. So let's say that okay. Well, let's say that all debts around all debts around the world were canceled, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, now who's the global superpower now? I mean, based on the military, United States probably. Yeah, but it, but then again, it's like we're in a whole different we're in a whole different climate now. Yeah. Like, do we look at like military now is a is a part of it and it plays a major role? But okay, but you also have tech out there. Yeah, like so. <laughs> Like, like, you know, and then on top of that, it's like, well, how does that play out? Like, so you're saying that would like? change the dynamics? It would of change what? the dynamics. Of it. it would change the dynamics. I mean, the fact that, and, and the fact that it like, you know, there's a lot of countries out there that like, we looked at, okay, of course we look at the overall debt, right? But then we also got to look at, okay, hey, America has never, you know, we've never defaulted yeah. on our debt. I don't know how with this high amounts of debt, but hey. Um, because I guess our revenue is still good. Um, but at the same token, it's like the thing that scares me is the fact that, okay, hey, well, what happens today that when we do start saying, okay, hey, we need to start cutting back, start taking care. you know, what does that do to places like education? You know, like, for example, we live in Washington state and then here we are in Seattle, Washington, where Seattle is like at a $260 million deficit. They got to figure out how is it that yeah. they can cut back spending. They select like they, they like raise taxes every day here. Right. So you got to raise taxes because you had an exorbitant amount of people leave the city to go to like places like Texas and, you know, yeah, and, and Florida. Well, now that's not revenue that you're going to be able to collect. And of course, you live in a state where there's no state income tax. So you're not collecting that revenue. 
So there's a lot of things at play. So now it's like on an $8 billion budget yeah. at a $260 million deficit. How do you reel it in? Yeah, well, cancel the debt. I'm pretty sure China will never agree to cancel the debt. We owe Absolutely them. <laughs> not. That would be like, and all those folks that are holding all those treasury bonds and notes and everything else, like, look, now they're, now, unless you're just saying that you're going to just pay them out dollar to dollar. Okay, that that's different. But, I mean. So is that really a bad thing that China owes so much of our debt? I don't look. I I look at it like this. It's like you know, you own the debt. Okay, you own the debt, but you don't own us. Yeah. So, I I I think that those two are not synonymous with each other. Okay. I think that ultimately, like you know, in order for China to be China or any of these other countries, they need like all these all countries must understand that economically and commerce wise, they need each other. Without them, then it, it upsets an, an entire order of things. And knocks everything out of balance, and we saw some of that with you know Russia, Ukraine, and how like that upset supply chain, that upset like you know commerce and everything else. Um, and again, it's like just because you own a debt doesn't mean that you own a person okay. or that you own a country. And what's your take on what's your philosophy on like, forgiving student loan debt? <laughs> I think that you know honestly. If we were able to bail out banks, then we should bail out students. I mean, it's way smaller, but I look at it like this from an economic standpoint. If you wipe out the debt, imagine the GDP that you can create. Like when we think about like the amount of growth that the U.S. can like literally grow at. Now, of course, in the interim, you'll have a lot of pissed off people because it's like, okay, hey, my taxes raised or whatever it is to be able to subside for the debt. But in the grand scheme of things, like look at the amount of jobs that you're going to be able to create. Look at the amount of like, you know, things in which that people are going to like, if a person's spending, I've, I've heard horror stories of people spending close to $1,500 a month. That's like a, like an apartment <laughs> rent just on their, on their student loan debt. Like imagine what you could do with that, like $1,500 a month. Like, let's say if you're PhD or grad school, or let's say $400, $200 or $600 a month for undergrad slash masters. That's a lot of money that could literally go into stimulating. So if we do that for everyone, it should be based on the situation. For example, suppose there's a guy out there, I'll make this up, Yeah, 30 years old, he has a degree in uh, liberal arts, a degree in water weaving. He's never worked in his life. Okay. Are we going like, to just pay off his $100,000 loan and then like, me. Has he never tried to go after a job or anything like that? He's, he's just been just... unemployed for six years. Has, course, he, I... has he actually tried to make payments towards the student loans? No. Or we'll say no. I mean, of course, that's a worst case scenario, you know. Well, I mean, I guess I'm going to have to go absolute here. So if you're going to pay, if you're, if you're going to wipe it out, then you're just going to have to wipe it. Okay. You're going to just wipe it out for all. And then the hope is, is that, of course, you're going to have the folks in whom which that will probably just never really contribute to society yeah. at all. But you. The, the assumption is, is that the vast majority of folks would be contributors that will ultimately play a major role towards economic progress. And I know, like, obviously, I look conservative against this, but I think you, you have the template to convince conservatives to vote for this, right? Because, of course, short term, we don't agree with it. But then, like I said, GDP, yep. increase tax, increase whatever you want to call it, like the long term yep. benefits. But yeah, but like most politicians, they just see the short term. You know, you see the memes, you want the, you want the plumbers and electricians to pay off this liberal arts education, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, but, and like I said, it's like, you know, imagine, like, like I said, like, that's money that can just go into the economy. Like, you know, that's money that can go into, like, neighborhoods and everything else. Like, for example, look at Medina, which is, like, one of, like, that's billionaires row. In Washington. And, like, you know, that most of the folks out there are millionaires, billionaires, right? They're one of the biggest counties that don't pay pretty much any taxes. And so, know. like, at one point, I think the city of Medina went bankrupt, or they were on the verge of going bankrupt. And for <laughs> those who don't know, that town is, like, pretty much, like, if you're a one percenter, that's the town you live in. That's the town that you live in. Pretty much, it isn't like if you drive there, they, you have, there's a sign that says you um, you consent to have your car filmed, <laughs> you know, 24-7 yeah. in this 24/7. town. 24-7, yes, because the security is like that. It's, it's the original, you know keep outsiders out you know it is that would be the true definition of the keeping the outsiders out like keep or just keeping you know we're keeping everything poor out and only yeah. the wealthy end. you make you make less than a million what are you doing here what are you doing here what is that like you know that's 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 a stick of gum to those individuals yeah. um but yeah i mean the roads are trash 
right? But they got, I mean, I don't really hear about any schools in Medina. Yeah. Like, you know, people go to. Like, most of them will send their kids to, like, Lakeside or something like that. So I look at it in the sense that, of course, like, if we look at the short term, if we always stay focused on the short term, then we won't go anywhere. Like, you know, if we look at like across the entire board, whether you're a publicly traded investor or if you're like a person on a startup, you know, of course, the sh you can't you can't escape the short term, you know, vision because it's right there in front of you. You see what you see that's in front of you. But a part of it is like you got to look towards the long term as it pertains to investment and say, OK, hey, well, you know, this is the impact, you know, four years from now. We're now in that era where it's like four years seems like long term, but look at how things change. Like. In four years, NVIDIA became a $3 trillion company. So, you know, with that to say, it's like, we got to have, we got to, we got to like take off sometimes the short-term goggles and put on the long-term vision and see like what's coming down the road. Mark, what's your take on universal basic income? <laughs> oh man, this is the only time when you're ever going to catch me like discussing like things like this. Like, this is weird. Um, if I'm looking at it from a finance perspective, okay, it makes sense. But then like now I start asking other questions, right? Like, okay, hey, what's the timeline of this universal basic income? What is the impact of like, say for example, the folks in whom much that are making the income, do they get to participate in some of that? And what does that look like towards their flow? And then ultimately, how does the bill get paid? Yeah. <laughs> like, how is the bill getting paid? And also, what is the long, like, what are we looking at as it pertains to a long-term impact? I'm sure that they've done some studies on it and shown yeah. that, like, I think that we've heard that there's some good things. I think that, you know, it, I think that, like, this is the reason why we have pilot programs. I think that the U.S. government should start doing more pilot programs and seeing, okay, hey, well, what does the data show us? Is the data showing us that, okay, that the person ultimately gets to a point where they're weaned off of it, where they don't no longer need it? Um, or is it something where they just become completely reliant on it? And then it's like, okay, well, did it, well, what did it do outside of a person just like saying, well, hey, I'm getting this universal basic income. So what do I need to do this for? Of course, that comes like people say AI is going to take jobs. Like the best example I have is like they say like, truck drivers going to be out of jobs, right? And so what do you do with them, you know? I don't think that truck drivers are going to be out of a job. I don't think that they're going to be out of a job. I think that ultimately that their jobs are just going to ultimately evolve. Well, yeah, like I think that else. like we thought the same thing when like people thought the same thing when the internet came out, when email yeah. came out, they're like, oh, oh, oh well, or, I won't have or, an or, assistant or, no or more. When cars came. And when cars came or say, for example, when we saw like, you know, we always have that. Con the first thing that the human mentality is so eager to hate something that it doesn't understand. And then once when we start to understand it, we, were, we sit back and we're like, oh, huh, it wasn't as bad as we thought it was. So I look at it in the stance of, look, will there be some jobs that will go away? Yes. Well, but will there be new jobs that are also created and involved in the process? Yes. Now, my question that I'm going to ask myself is, are there more jobs coming in versus jobs that are going out? And if we could say that there are more jobs coming in than there are going out, I'm good with that. If it's more jobs going out than coming in, then, okay, we need to take a look at that and see why. And you know, for the people out there who are like, you know, kind of like stubborn, old head or whatever, don't want to retrain, is that matter of us saying, okay, the training is for you to find these new jobs. Yeah. You don't want to do it. And there's nothing we you don't do want to do. You. Yeah. Okay. I mean, but I think that it's like we should still encourage people. Like, I think the biggest thing, the reason why people are that they don't do things is because they're afraid. Like, you know, a lot of times we do things out of fear. Like I said, the human mentality is to hate something that it doesn't understand, you know, but once when they start to understand it, they realize, oh, it's not that bad and it actually helps. Um, it's just like, okay, hey, a person goes, it's like, okay, hey, I'm looking at, I want to get out of this industry and maybe go work in cybersecurity. Okay, hey, go take your CIA Security Plus and maybe go work for the U.S. government or go work at other companies. And it doesn't take that much. You can go spend $600 on Coursera now versus going to a program and spending $60,000 a year. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean... With that, with the technology that is being created, it creates opportunities for folks in whom which that were once upon a time considered outliers or a, or a certain part of a majority that just couldn't see a way in and now it's creating space. What, like, what do you say, Kassara, YouTube University, all this free education, do you think we're even going to have colleges in like 10, 20 years? I think that we will. I think that ultimately that we'll just have to drop a lot of the degrees in which that ultimately it was just like, you know, like a general studies major, like what? <laughs> I mean, if you haven't learned general studies by the time that you finish, like, high school or, like, you know, 
I just don't get it. Yeah. But like, you know, degrees like becoming a doctor, still being a lawyer, uh, an engineer, like whether civil, mechanical, electrical, those things, you know, yeah, you can go learn some of those courses on a, through a program, but I still believe that, you know, certain education, certain things that you gather, certain knowledge and, 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 and you know, not only just theory, but actual real world knowledge that gets instilled in application of how to apply it. Yeah, you just can't replace that class. So we take on this, like, I think there's some people out there, like, they get it right. They're, they have focus, they have drive. Yeah. They're trying to make the world a better place. Yep. Other people, not so much, right? <laughs> they want to watch the world burn. <laughs> yeah. So, like, is that because, the, like, genetics, their parenting, the people around them, or is this, like, random chance people like this, you think? I think it's a mixture of both. I think it's a mixture of both. Like, you know, you could be raised in a great household, and yet you could still be, a, you know, you could still, you know, make bad decisions or ultimately be a terrible person or be a phenomenal person. Um, I think it comes down to a matter of choices. A person is a sum, uh, I always believe that a person is the sum total of their choices. So you could be raised in a great household and yet make terrible choices and then ultimately here we are. Um, you can make, you can be raised in a terrible household and still make great choices and then ultimately here you are. Um, but then at the same token, it's like, you know, hey, like you could be a person in whom wish that is raised in a great home, make great choices, but yeah, the same token, something something fell off track, um, and ultimately it it grew, you know, and that you know the person that you once knew, they're no longer the same person. So, it it varies. Do you think someone can be in one group and switch to other group? Or you, of course, okay, of course. I mean, it's not to say that a person was always bad from <laughs> day one. Like when I grew up, I was a terrorist. It's like, well, okay, let me, in context, like. <laughs> Not like it, I was like I used to terrorize like you know people like like my parents and stuff like that. I was I w I always caused mischief. You know, am I a troublemaker today? Probably, but not as much yeah. as I once was. So yeah, I switched from a different group, saying like, look, I got to grow up. That's I can't run at the speed anymore. Like you know, I got to make better decisions. So like I said, choices. So let me ask you this: like, suppose there's a group of people, right? Let's say they're economically well off, like they're like rich, they have they control jobs, they yep. need to. They need to hire people that have networks and all kind of stuff. Yep. There's another group somewhere that's like economic disadvantage. Mm. Should the people above reach down and bring them up, or is it supposed to be the person, people at the bottom to, to find these opportunities? I think that ultimately nobody ever makes it successfully by themselves. So you're going to need a little bit of both. You're going to need the people in whom which that you stand on the shoulders of, which are the people in which that you come from the bottom. You stand on their shoulders because ultimately they will want you to ultimately have a better life than what they've had, right? I mean, you know, parents ultimately want their children to have a better life than what they ultimately experience. Communities that ultimately, you know, help raise a child ultimately want them to like live in a world that was better than it found them. But then there's also the folks in whom which that have been very fortunate. Like you should realize that, okay, hey, you know, You've been given a lot, but at the same token, there's a requirement uh, in the sense of make it better. Like if you have the power to make, if you have a power of influence, then use that influence to make things around you better. Like, you know, for me, it's like I look at it in the sense of, okay, you know, the little successes that I've had, it's like, okay, well, make it better for the folks in whom which that, that come after me because of the fact that it's just like, if not, then what world is that? What world is it if we don't if we don't provide opportunity if we don't make opportunity for those in whom which they didn't have it like what's the point so in your linkedin it says a uh, di disrupt disrupt <laughs> everything innovation do you ever get any grief from anyone who says no di means diversity inclusion and equity absolutely not no no, no one's giving no grief yet okay uh, actually i'm surprised of that to be honest with you i thought something I, well hold on i, I take that back i take like, that back my wife Okay. Because my wife uh, does a lot of HR. Okay. And she does a lot of inclusion and equity. Yeah, I don't think you get, you got a lot of hate, like messages. Not like, hate. No, I don't get hate. I mean, I get people that ask me questions about it. And I and I always tell them, I was like, you know, if we're going to reach a world that's equitable, it's going to have to, like, the ideas are going to have to be innovative. You're not going to be able to solve the problems that ultimately with the same mindset of how we got here. So how did you come up with that that saying? Just popping your head one day, or like how did that come about? Well, I mean, it's always about innovation. Like you know, you've known me for quite some time. It's like you know, it's always about innovation. Innovation is disruptive, you know. But at the same token, it creates opportunity. 
you know, it creates spaces. It creates spaces even in the sense that you may do things selfishly, but then at the same token, unselfishly, it opens up opportunities, it opens up doors. Um, so I think that that's the only way that we're going to actually ever get there. We're going to have to be disruptive. We're going to have to cause a little trouble. <laughs> also somewhere, I think it's on LinkedIn too, or your website okay. says, I have dedicated my entire career and life to leaving the war better than how it discovered me. Yeah. How are you going about doing this? Like what's your process for making this come true? Yeah. So like, for example, the work that I've done at the come up series, you know, honestly, I realized that there was a lot of financial information that essentially that people that look like me or just from different various backgrounds, they weren't getting because the information seemed so far away. Okay. My, my goal was to make the information a lot closer and much more digestible. So that way everybody can understand it. Um, that's one thing. Um, because how I found the market, <laughs> it was like a scary place. Um, it there was nobody there to really give me the like the the blueprint or like okay, hey, this is how you do this. You know, I had my grandfather and his group of buddies, but then by the time when I got to college, it was just like okay, hey, you're on your own. I'm going to go talk to like professors who teach finance, and not even able to get a straight answer. So I was like, okay, hey, like I don't want the I don't want the people that follow after me to have to go through those types of hurdles, um, and if I can help help them avoid some of those by like building better bridges, then let's do that. The work that I do at FTC, you know, again, making sure that founders of color have opportunity in which that they have a support system that can truly help them build, you know, and also be prepared for what's coming on the other side of the mountain. Didn't have that. A lot of times I had to feel <laughs> my way through. I had to make a lot of mistakes in the process. So, you know, again, it's like, you know, leaving the world better than the way that it found you is like the world found me like this. This is the area, this was the era that I dropped off in. Now it's like, okay, hey, well, can I de help democratize that to make it more accessible and available to everybody so that way they can take advantage. And as, as the day, you think you're doing a good job of that goal? I hope so, man. Like, you know, I think that it's too soon to call. <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to tell you that I've, I've done it. I've solved it um, because I'm still in the process. And I think that I probably will never. I'm lucky if I'm if I'm in a space where I can see the fruits of my labor fully like exemplified. Like I see pieces of it, but I haven't seen the full picture yet. Um, and I hope that I can see it. Um, I hope I can, you know be around long enough to be like, okay, hey, like, you know, this is the impact. This is how it changed. And I can see like, okay, hey, I helped do that. Um, but I feel like I'm just getting started. I feel like I, sometimes I wake up and I'm like, damn, I'm still in the starting box. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm kind of making these numbers up, but I think it read somewhere like, you know, like if a dollar spent in the, the white community, it's like thousand dollars to spend, it's spent like, like 500. And I think in the black community, it's like low as like $15, right? Yep. Like, is there a way to impact or change this? Like, why is this this cultural? Just like how things have been? Like, I mean, each like our community has been very much so well rounded into being consumers. We consume a lot, you know. But it's like it's more so in the sense of it's nothing wrong with being a consumer, but also build things. You know, that's how the that's how the dollar like really increases when you build things and it extends not only just within your community, but it extends outward outside of the community. And then you bring it back and you make that investment into the community to enrich things. Like I'll give you an example. Growing up for me, um, there was a person by the name of Trish. She did technology access foundation. She became a millionaire when Microsoft went public and she had millions. Yeah. Yeah. I know, I know what that is. Yeah. Yeah. So, so then she started this program and I was one of, I was the second year of that program. I came in the second year. Talk about program. the one out of federal way, right? No, 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 no. Oh. This was in Seattle. Oh, like, so they, they started okay. in Seattle okay. and then they, they ultimately extended to federal way. Okay. Did not places. know that. So for us, it was like, we were the second year that came in first year. They were, you know, they, they were the first year. And so for us, it was just like, okay, providing opportunity and space. Now looking at all of us that literally went to the program, a lot of us went through the tech space. You know, a lot of us went through and like literally have had, have had great careers and everything else um, within tech. But to see how that did, that one specific thing of making that slight investment into things. Sorry if you guys hear butter in the background. But like having that, that small investment, look at what it's been able to produce. Like you got folks that are like literally dominating and VPs at tech companies and 
literally giving back to their community, making sure that like kids are able to learn and have the information. That's what it looks like. We just need more of that. They ready to do a drink? Yeah, let's do it. All right, what are we drinking? So I know you like rum. Here's some rum. If you want some rum. I, I do like rum. Okay, we're gonna do some rum. Oh man, see, look at this. It, it's got a certain type of logo on it. This is gonna ruin my day. <laughs> just kidding. All right, are we both? Are we both? Yeah. Okay, so are you? You're, you're the host, so I'm gonna. You just say when. That's good. Okay. There we go. We're gonna start it off like that. I think we're we're actually pretty level on the pour. All right, sir. My Cheers. Ooh, that's good. Yeah. Ooh, that's dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly right. <laughs> that's dangerous. Yes, yes. Okay. So next one, you have a motto, be remarkable. Oh, man, yeah. What does that mean to you? Like, define be remarkable. Like, do you, is that expectation for yourself, expectation of people around you? It's both. It's both like, you know, when, when you see that on my email signature, it's just, you know, reminding everybody, like, whatever you do, like, you know, make sure that's remarkable, you know, pass it on, you know, pass it on to other folks. I mean, now I see yours and I think it's like, be, be great, great every yeah. day. Like, that's dope because I think it, it like, we all have the opportunity of like, just like, even if you have a bad day. 24 hours okay the next day let's work on like let's okay forget about yesterday let's focus on today what is it that we can do that yeah. can like literally be, be so great small today? you know doesn't have like, to be like you don't have to cure cancer every day right, right. you don't have to cure. you don't have to cure cancer if you can great yeah <laughs> but if you can't like okay what's the iteration yeah. process towards yeah. getting there and, it, and it, you may not ever cure cancer but you may have rem like removed a lot of the barriers for somebody else to step in and say okay hey like i'm you know, you're picking up where that person left off. So it's like, those are the things that are remarkable. Like, make the journey remarkable. So back to finance, right? Yeah. I mean, obviously, like, public schools do a horrible job teaching kids, like, finance stuff, you know. Parents they don't probably, teach it at all. Parents could probably do a horrible job of teaching finance, right? It's like, we just leave kids, like, people out in the open here flapping our figure out, right? Yeah. It's like, and of course, you change that with your series and stuff, but, like, how do you, like, how do we make people spawn on money, right? Like, is it even possible? Is that like a, is that like a moonshot you're trying to do? How do we make them, uh, wait, how do we make them do what now? Make, become smarter on money. How do we make them smarter on money? Okay, so first things first, you have to address their relationship that they have. With you. Like, I think that no, like, in a, lot of, in a lot of families, a lot of families don't sit down and talk to each other and talk together and talk about like, okay, hey, well, what is it that mom and dad do? Or what is that mom or what is it that dad does? Um, whatever the dynamic is. And essentially, we don't talk about those things. The other thing that we don't talk about is, um, you know, hey, like the relationship with money. Like, it's very taboo. Um, and I found that when we were doing the come up series, like, I realized, like, but he really talked about it. Like, it was just like, you know, keeping it to myself. I don't want to talk to anybody. But once when we started desensitizing people towards that conversation, we started noticing that things started changing. Um, and I think that we need to do more of that. I think that schools need to do more of that, like understanding how things work versus just telling us, okay, this is, this, it just works like this. No, why does it work like this? Like, okay, understanding like, okay, hey, like, you know, why, like, why is it that the value, like, why is it that, you know, you should be more conscious as it pertains to your spending? Where does the dollar go? Like, you know, I wish, I wish schools taught about how companies make money. Like, I sit down sometimes, like, one of the things that I do with my nieces and nephews, which I've realized, none of them learn. And they take, like, AP classes and all this other stuff, which is astounding to me. And I sit back and ask them, how does Apple work as a company? You know, like, they just sell phones. Really? <laughs> um, but then it, it opens up the door to have a conversation, which now is like, okay, now they're having this conversation with me. And once when they figure out, oh, I got it. It's amazing because now the conversation stems and they're not afraid to carry that conversation to their friends and everything. But it's just like, okay, hey, we we gotta have the conversation. I think that that's the part that's missing in education. Education goes beyond the building. It's just if a person learns, that's education. At what age should we start teaching kids money? Like 
three, five. As soon as possible. As soon as possible. As soon as possible. Like when a, when a kid wants to go buy something at a store or when they want you to buy something for them at the store, there it is. <laughs> let me let me learn you something a little. Maybe you do the cost benefit analysis of this. Or opportunity cost. Like, look, hey, you want me to go buy you, you want me to go buy you a phone. This phone costs a thousand dollars. Our mortgage, <laughs> what mom and dad have to pay every month is three thousand dollars. So by me spending a thousand dollars towards your phone, literally leaves mom and dad a thousand dollars at a deficit. How do we make that? How do we make that up? Well, we'll we'll still have some money, but then ultimately we're gonna have to figure out what is that we're gonna cut in order to make that happen for you to get this a thousand dollar phone. We spend a thousand dollars a month on you for food. We buy the phone <laughs> if you don't eat so much. Hey, peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> it's about to be a thing. Um, but it, like I said, it's it's understanding those conversations, those type of critical thinking conversations with kids. And the thing is, it's like we always try to shield them from it because we feel like, okay, well, they're not ready for it. Or they're like they we're trying to protect them, right? We're trying to protect them, like they can't handle it. And I'm like, these kids are very resilient. Like, nobody can tell me anything about a kid's resiliency. They survived the pandemic. I just went to my niece's graduation and her freshman year was 2020. Now it's like she's getting ready to go to school for business. Look, you guys can't tell me anything. These kids are resilient. So tell me more about the, the, the come up series. Yeah. Like how it got started. What's it about? Oh, so the come up series got started. Uh, Jolyn, my co-host um, and co-creator. Uh, I started off mentoring her in the, in the market. Like a lot of folks have like said, hey, Mark, can you pull me aside? Teach me like how to invest or how to trade in the market. And, you know, at the time I had the time to do so. I was like, okay, hey, cool. Um, and then she posted on it. Like we, we went through about a year, a year and a half, and she made quite the return. And she posted on her social media. Hey, I made like this is this is the percentage that I made. Like, you know, she was just doing it as a, you know, a, a progress report like she was very proud of herself um and then next thing you know it's like you know her 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 social media is flooded and i'm like like I'm she was, and so she so then she, she responded like to some folks and she was like yeah you know my mentor mark helped me out it's kind of the blue it, it just became a firestorm yeah it became a firestorm and so i'm like I'm bombarded with messages. She's bombarded with messages. I'm overwhelmed. So I'm sitting there at the supercharger station, just charging my car. And I'm like, Jolene, like, <laughs> thanks for the heads up. <laughs> and so then she was like, yeah, I know. And then there was just like this awkward quiet between us. And she was like, but you realize like, you know, that this could really like, if we really did something like this and like literally showed people like, you know, the way and literally you got to educate them. You know, this would be monumental. And it's a series that y'all still doing? Yeah, we still do it. I mean, we're, we're it's on, like a weekly series, monthly series. So we went from doing like lives like every like Tuesday and Thursday, then to doing every Tuesday. And then we just kind of like got to this place where we were like, you know, we've already filmed over 400 episodes. And so we were just like, okay, let's like, I needed a break and Jolene needed a break. Like it was just like the burnout of being a content creator for those that don't understand it's like it's it's a very real thing and i was getting burnt out i was like you know hey like you know i'm typically working on this these things behind the scenes and then i only sometimes only had like 30 minutes to prepare for an episode right before we go live and so jolene was like hey i want to learn about this can you teach me this today that's the episode um and so then we got to this point where it's just like i said almost burnout so i was like okay well I want, I need to go back and like level set and like, what is it that I want to teach moving forward? And now that we're getting ready to go into a whole different phase, which is still going to talk about investment and everything else, but I also want to talk about the other side of investments, the other wealth transfer, small business, startups, those things, because those things create wealth transfers just as big, if not bigger than the publicly traded markets. So recently you were a keynote speaker at, I think it's called Venture Coworking Mechanics Studio in Bellevue. Yep for a black founders and funders event. Can mm -hmm. you talk about that? Yeah, so Evan Ponsolet uh, invited me to literally come and speak. Um, and pretty much, it was amazing. Um, it was far, because it's Bellevue. <laughs> but it was it was good. Um, 
And it was just more so in the sense of just like sharing, you know, my insights, you know, some of the things in which that founders, you know, don't really look at, though that they're going through those challenges, but nobody ever really takes a step back to like really think about those things, my journey. Um, and honestly, I mean, it was, it was great. I mean, I think that they're doing some pretty phenomenal stuff there. The questions that was asked uh, were good. Um, I wish I had more time to like do that. And like to extend the interview, but like, hey, you know, I get to do this one, so I'm probably sure that this is going to be an extension. <laughs> so, so what's your take on the Seattle startup scene? Like, my criticism has been there's always this like <laughs> silos, right? There's like Founders Live, you take Northwest, yeah, thing in Bellevue is like startup haven. You go on and on on them, right? Yeah, like, but that's like any of them communicate, right? Yeah, like everyone's in these silos. There's no cross pollination, for lack of a better term, right? Yep, like. Think this is a Seattle culture thing, or is this... I think so. I think it's a part of that, and then also in the sense that Seattle is very much so publicly traded companies. I mean, with a few growth companies here, and but people don't realize that there's a lot of companies that IPO or have successful exits that come out of Seattle. But the problem is that you have a lot of folks that are trying to step into the venture capital space that could be the new bloods to change over the old guard of venture capital per se. Um, but a lot of them just don't know how to get started or the you know, there's not really a strong ecosystem here um, that I hope that that changes. And I, I'm doing some work to try to help change that um, because, you know, my gripe with Seattle startup uh, community, it's and it, and it hasn't changed. Um, yeah, it hasn't changed at all. And I sit back and look at it. And I'm like, man, we could do so much better. You know, I think that our startups like that literally come out of Seattle are better than like, you know, a lot of the companies that you see coming out of San Francisco, Silicon Valley, or, you know, Texas or Florida or where, or Boulder, Colorado, or New York. I think that we're just better. I think that it's like, you know, when you look at the, when you look at the infrastructure that surrounds Seattle, you know, there's a lot of millionaires per capita here. <laughs> so you don't really have to worry about that issue. Um, it's just more so how you get them into the fold. Um, the angel groups, I'm not really quite a fan of. I really believe that honestly, like there just needs to be a complete re reset on that one. Venture capital community is good, but yet at the same token, it's just like it just sometimes moves too slow. Um, let's see here. Also, um, it's like this gatekeeping thing where it's just like we're just not so like we need to accept risk. I think that's the biggest thing. If I was just, if I was to sum it up, like Seattle's become very risk averse, you know, for the startups that ultimately like a lot of the startups here that raise capital, they'll have some of the folks that are part of their round, but majority of their round will be filled by Silicon Valley. Why? Yeah, that shouldn't even be a that shouldn't even be a conversation. I mean, not to say that Silicon Valley money is great, but it's just like okay, well, why is it that we can't? Why is it that we can't mimic that? Yeah, I know some investors who say we only invest in companies that deserve funding. Right? I can like easily name ten people I know who. Are couldn't get a meeting here. Exactly. Went to the Bear, New York, or somewhere, and within six months, got got money right. Exactly. And it's like, like I said, we got to do better. We like we as a whole, as a city, and also as a state, we got to do better because it's these. The one thing I will say though is that the companies here, they're good, they're very good, and they're coached very very well. The problem is, is like I said, it's missing that other side of that infrastructure that folks didn't. So they someone did. told me this one time, I'm going to get your take on it, right? Yeah. I was talking to this guy in the Bay Area, and he's telling me the, the reason Seattle and the Bay Area is so different, he said in the Bay Area, of course, all the VCs were former startup investors. I mean, for, former founders, right? Yeah. And he said also when in the Bay Area, when a proposal comes against the crowd for, say, $50 million, they reinvest in the community. Yeah. Whereas in Seattle, all the investors are like from Microsoft, Amazon, have no idea to start a company. And yep. for some reason, the people that get acquired here usually don't reinvest in community. No, they don't. Yeah. No, they don't. Like, I mean, it's very rare. Like, you know, like normally when you became acquired, then ultimately you would ultimately go and either start your own fund or go join a fund as an LP. Um, and then essentially you keep the ecosystem going, you keep it growing. You don't really see that happen. It's a very unfortunate that that happens. And a lot of the folks that made their money here made their money when companies went public or, you know, they then wanted to do real estate. And then it's like, because real estate is considered safer. And then of course, like, you know, then they join these angel groups, which they think that are good for them. But then it's just like, okay, hey, a startup shouldn't have to spend twenty five thousand dollars in order to raise capital. Yeah. Like, if a startup idea is good and the founders, uh, if they have like showing the proof, 
that they are building a viable idea that is ultimately getting traction. And, and why are you making people go through a six month process? It should not be. No matter on the amount of money like some of these groups give you, it's a lot of money, but cost benefit analysis, all the time you spent, I, I don't know. At, again, it's like you're expecting companies to move. Well, and that's the thing. San Francisco would be considered growth investors. They focus on growth. Seattle investors would be considered value investors. Folks that pay, care about like, you know, in publicly traded markets, they care about dividends and all this other stuff, valuations, you know, which is, I mean, they're both, they both serve a good purpose, but we're talking about startups here. Yeah. We're talking about folks in whom much that are trying to validate an idea and they're getting validation in the market that shows that there's traction. Now it just means that essentially that it needs the investment. And I think the thing is like, if you're going through a two to three month, you know, due diligence process on a pre-seed or a seed company, why? Like they've already done X amount of the work that ultimately yeah. shows you that they got here. So why is it taking yeah, that's my joke too. Seattle investors only have an A round metrics for you know pre seed round. And so like every month I I, I have MC this thing called Seattle Startup XO, like early stage pitch ups. Mm -hmm. So I talked to I mean one guy yesterday, he's in Seattle. He said he met with a VC, he didn't tell me the name. He said they told him, Come back to us if you have five hundred thousand dollars MMR. Like five hundred thousand dollars. I mean another guy who's coming to, came from the Bay Area for the couple of days, he said he has a friend who just closed a ten million dollar investment from Greylock. He's he has no metric. The ten million dollars help him get to his first metric. Exactly. Like like this is craziness. <laughs> I mean, so you're telling me, everyone, if you're a startup, you need to move to the Bay Area. Uh, no. What I'm telling you is, if you have a startup, you don't have to move to the Bay Area, but you just need to go look towards the Bay Area. As it you better have a lead direct. I had to spend some time there, right? Spend some time. Yeah, you know, because, and it, it it pains me to say that. I mean, you know me well enough to know that, that 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 hurts me to have to say, look, you're gonna have to go to Silicon Valley, or you're gonna have to go here in order to raise capital, like to raise a, a strong capital. Because, and, it, and it's a shame that the fact that it's like, look, they're not afraid to take risk. And it's like, you know, everybody here wants to have the winner or they yeah. want to have like winners. Your portfolio is not always gonna be filled with winners. Yeah, the best example I have, I can't, man, I wish I could remember her name, but she has some kind of sales tech platform, right? Mm -hmm. Like no one gave her me at all, right? Nothing at all, right? She had to get a job. She took a job in New York City, still did this type of side. A year later, she got like a five hundred thousand dollars seed round, blew up. Someone also gave her like ten million dollars seed round. After the seed round, she said like pretty much every investor in Seattle, hey, congrats for success. Let's have a conversation. And of course, she was like, Jason, I don't be paid, but fuck the motherfucker, right? I said you can't. Facts. I said you can't be like, like that. Like I right? said, it leaves a sour taste in people's mouths. Yeah. Like it does leave a sour taste in people's mouths. And the reason why is because again, you nailed it on the head. The reason why Silicon Valley is better is because of the fact is that those folks were startups. They were founders. Also. A lot of the folks here, they may have worked at the company where they worked underneath those founders, but they were never founders. Yeah. And it's like they don't under like. They understand what it like some of the the metrics of success, but then at the same token, if you ever ask them to go out there and create that, could they do that? And you think since they come from Amazon, Microsoft, Microsoft, they're using like these big company metrics? Yes. To determine if these yes. That's what I said. Successful. It's like you're using you're using value based investing versus like that's not startups. It's like if you're looking to be a value based investor in startups, then you're in the wrong business. You, startups is all about growth. It's all about, okay, hey, can I spot the growth? Is there opportunity? Is there is there viability towards this growth? And what you're doing right now, is it pointing you in the direction towards reaching that area of growth? To be a VC, I know you have to have a certain amount of money, or not money, but yep. like, like you have to have, like, is that certification you get? Or anyone can say, I'm Jason Kavnis, I'm a VC. Yeah, you can be a VC. Okay. I mean, if you meet the metrics as it pertains to, okay. like, you know, becoming an accredited investor. Okay. okay. You could be an angel investor, too. You could be, you could be an angel investor too, and essentially being an angel investor is just like, okay, hey, well, you make micro uh, investments. Yeah. I mean, you know, Dave McClure uh, invested in five hundred startups as an angel investor. He put his money where his mouth is. You know, like, hey, you got a great idea? Okay, pitch it to me. Let me hear it. I'll ask you questions. If it, if it sounds good, and if ultimately the data checks out, okay, boom. Here's a check next week. So do you see any any like change in the Seattle startup scene? Is this like, is this this the way it is? And people just have to like. I definitely see a change people. coming. I definitely see a change coming. You know, I definitely see that there's entities here that you know that are looking to step into the city, and possibly make a run at changing of the old guard. I mean, keep in mind, it's like you got the Madronas of the world that have been here, and their claim to fame is like you know being one of the first investors in Amazon. 
you know, and a lot of folks are running off of like, you know, their claims of fame of working on specific companies within enterprise or, you know, startups that have literally gone on to be growth companies. Great. But at the same token, it's like the ecosystem is ultimately going to die if people don't realize and wake up that, okay, hey, we need to see some significant changes here. You know, and somebody's got to bring that conversation to the forefront. So. Is there any like tech out there that excites you? Of course, AI, all this stuff, like, is there any like, specific tech that's exciting to you right now? Oh, of course. I mean, like for me, I'm a technophile. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I love all things tech. Like, I, it's like I'm a tech enthusiast at, at, to my core. So, you know, iterations excite me. Uh, do you still do the, I think that beta testing on Apple? Of course, I'm using iOS 18 right now. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's to my, it, like, I, I'm like a kid in the candy store. As soon as the announcement's over 15 minutes later, hey, is the, is the build available? <laughs> I'm still that guy. Um, but what excites me? Um, what excites me is the fact that we're starting to see that generative AI and everything else is moving from cloud to personal devices. I think that that's the that's the crazy part right there, that you know honestly, can you believe it that we're here where we're seeing personal computing and everything else, literally getting to the foray, of, hey, wow, it's no longer just going to be in the cloud anymore. You're going to have all this AI power in your hand. That's magical. Do you think people are ready for that? A lot of people still can't like turn their TV on, you know. Hey, look that. I escalate that to a higher power. It's above me. <laughs> but I think that, yeah, I think that in the grand scheme of things, the world is ready. You know, we're, we're past the point of people needing instruction manuals of how to use things. We're past the point of like, okay, hey, well, when you get a device, you know exactly how it works. We're past that point. Now we're at the place of like, where it's like, now it's the expectation of things working. It's the expectation of like, okay, hey, well, this works, but what is the, what else can I do with it now? What's like a tech predicts you have for the future? <laughs> <laughs> like mine is, I believe that like, Skynet. That's Skynet. <laughs> okay, 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 good, 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 good. Uh, I think in a sooner or later, you know how you go on cruises right now. Yeah, you better go to like cruises in space and go for like hotel to hotel in space. Okay, that's what I think. That's I think my, that we're probably like fifteen years out, but yeah, I think that, that can happen. I think that ultimately, well, teleportion, the teleportation would be cool. So um, some Rick and Morty stuff. Yeah, you know, that would be amazing. But I think that ultimately we're getting into the place of like, you know, holographic communication. I think that, that would be amazing. Um, which also stems it into many different other spaces. I think we're in the place of we're at the very eve of robotics. I mean, of course, don't get me wrong, your Boston Dynamics and everybody else, they've done very, very well. But I think that now that the AI is getting so good, that now is gonna need actual. Have you seen what they're doing in China? Of course. That's, that's insane. But I mean, but but it's like you know, it's the iterative process. We were we were bound to get there. Yeah. You but now we're in a growth phase where it's like things are going to come a lot faster. Mm -hmm. We're not like, I think we're in we're in AI inning three point. We're in we're in the fourth inning of AI. So you do you you gonna like buy a robot for your house? I mean, my wife says if it cooks and cleans and doesn't break dishes, then we're good. <laughs> yeah, but think with that, like joke I have like, close your Erica, tell a robot. Hey, cook me dinner. I want, I want some pork ribs. Mark, you look at the restaurant. Blah blah blah. You eat a salad today. I mean, my wife would do the same thing. So. <laughs> what's I mean, the what's hey, the hey, at least you're looking out for me, yeah, right? Hey, okay. At least you're looking out for me. I talk around too. I'll get a robot. That shit has to be like four two, fifty five pounds. I don't want no like fucking six foot two, two hundred fifty pound robot in my house, right? Why not? Yeah. I mean, imagine if you have to carry all the like. Imagine if you have to like build something. In your yeah, what if, what if it goes rogue? What if someone hacks it? It says, take out Jason. Wow. Well, I mean, hey. <laughs> I mean, I look at it and it says, like, look, if, if if somebody did that to me, I'm like, hey, take out Mark. Look, <laughs> I hope the life that I live was great. <laughs> I hope that it was amazing. Somebody's going to learn and fix this. <laughs> I just happen to be the martyr for for the, for this iteration of fixes. Yeah, but I, I, it's definitely coming right. I don't think there's anything anyone can do to stop it. But next question, like, do you think the average American realizes like what's coming, like how advanced tech's gonna be, or do you think there's like the, the bubble they have? They have no idea. Um, I think the average American has an idea, but they don't fully know yet. I think that they're only seeing what they see, but I think that they're like we're they're participating in the discussion though, which is a good thing. So now they can say, okay, hey, well, okay. 
we've got these things going on. I can kind of put piece two and two together. And then common sense ultimately takes over and it's just like, all right, well. I mean, what happens if someone's speeding, they get pulled over and our robot cop walks up to them. Oh, well, then you're ticket. screwed. Imagine imagine trying to, like, uh, like, we're gonna get there, but imagine trying to, like, debate that ticket. Yeah. <laughs> like, you're done. Like, I think that we're getting to a place where I think that we're gonna also start having cameras and AI cameras that also detect speed and, like, yeah. record it at the time and everything else and be able to show you, like, from my, a mile of you speeding. Yeah. <laughs> so, I... We, I think the thing is, is like again, we always look at the. It's it's good for us that we're looking at the negative because it also keeps us grounded of like, okay, hey, these things can happen. And of course, we're seeing all the great things. But my thing is, it's like I'm looking at it in the sense of the gray area. Like, you know, what else? Like, what what else is this going to spawn? What is this going to birth? Um, do you think any? Do you think there's anything after AI? Oh yeah, I mean, it flips intelligent assistance. Okay. When AI gets to a place in which that is like, okay, hey, we've done so well, and then it's gotten to a place of like so much training, now it just becomes intelligent assistance, and now it's just application. So here's one go off the rails. I know a lot of people out there, some regular smart people, they'll argue that since AI is around, that proves simulation theory. I mean, yeah, it, it could. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it could, but I mean, I, I still think that there's some things in which that, you know, has that fully proven simulation theory? Probably. Okay. We're probably like, because mind you, we're still training models. Yeah. And these are just like people are so excited over large language models, mm -hmm. things in which that have already existed. If you think about it, we could have been using our social media to just train train a lot of a lot of these language models in the beginning. Like that's that's the real kicker to it. Like you know, think about all those debates that people had on social media about Michael Jordan or LeBron James being the goat. Yeah. I mean. Think about all the times that AI was just sitting there, like the training models are just sitting there like, oh, okay, well, all right. <laughs> all the recipe data, all the foodies out there, it's just learning. It's still learning. We're still training. And it all started from, is this a cat? Is this a dog? Yeah. That's true. So next, talk about um, something else you do called From the Culture. Okay. How that got started and talk about that. So it got started when ultimately... And that's different from the Come Up series, right? Different. different things. Okay. Uh, but... From the culture is the parent company to the come up series. So essentially it's like we are, we oversee the come up series, um, but Jolene runs it as CEO. She runs uh, the come up series as CEO. So the way that from the culture started was the fact that, you know, I was in venture capital and I was just like, okay, hey, this is great, you know, but it sucks. I hated everything about it. And the reason why I hated venture capital was because of the fact that it felt like a suit. <laughs> they skilled just a little bit. Oh, yeah. So I felt like a suit. Um, you hear a lot of great ideas, you invest in them, and then that's it. Like, you know, where's the fun in that? Like, okay, hey, yeah, sign term sheet, you know, whatever. But the ultimate fun is, like, being in the room when a problem is being solved. Like, you can't replace that energy. You can't replace that part of, like, you know, being able to ask yourself, where was I when this was solved? And then it, it just really gave light to me when I said, okay, I looked back and I said, all right, well, there's a lot of great ideas from a lot of great founders who don't really look like the typical status quo. Why is it that, you know, I'm not seeing them? And so then I started like asking the question of like, what's going on here? And I realized a lot of these folks have great ideas, but they just don't have the technical know-how. Like they don't know how to write code. They don't know how to write a backend infrastructure in Node.js or do the front end or do the design in Figma. They don't know how to do the API integration and all that other stuff. They're, that's not them. They just have a great idea, and they can probably execute on the business side, but essentially they need help. And so I literally said, okay, hey, well, I like some of the things of venture capital, which is like having the, the equitable position. But then I also like the entrepreneurial the entrepreneurship side where I get to get my hands dirty. So how is that I can like literally make those two things and then that's when I started giving FTC some serious thought. You know, really work with companies from the ground up, take a minority stake. So our average take is anywhere from 25 to roughly 30% of a company. So we're founders. And we stick with them for the lifeblood of the company. And then we get to help them build not only an MVP, but also get them to a place of scale. They'll probably remove us around Series B, which most of the time, you know, when you start to make those transitions and startups around Series B, and we're okay with that if they need us, but we can always keep the board seat as an advisory and also a person that's fighting in their corner. 
but I mean, that's really, that's really the basis of how, like I thought about like FTC. I was like venture capital itself. Yeah. It, it plays a role, but it's not the only role. Like things got to change. And do you still make investments as an actual VC? Oh, that's, no, that's, 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 that's part done. of your life. Okay. That's done. So are, we, are you doing your VC thing, right? What, um, what, what would make you like take a pitch and make you invest? Like what, what would a founder do to impress you? So to speak, for lack of a better term, I'm looking for another me. <laughs> yeah. Good luck with that. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've ran into a few, but I, I mean, all jokes aside, I'm looking for like, you know, when I sit in a pitch, I'm looking for like, there's, there's the pitches that wow you. There's the pitches that scare you. And then there's the pitches that are those can, those are those ones that are in the mix where they're a mixture of both and they make you just say, holy shit. Those are the ones that you invest in. The other ones are the ones in which that they may not be ready yet, or they may have something that's viable, but at the same time, it's just like, okay, well, it's a great idea, but you know, what's the staying power look like? And so when I look at those things, I'm just like, okay, that if you can make me say, holy shit, or make me scared of something in the sense of a good way. Oh yeah. I mean, I, I would want to invest. And like, how do you determine like your equity stake? Was it just case by case basis or any kind of university was the same equity? Like case by case basis. And then on top of that, it depends upon what is it that they're trying to raise you know, valuations. What does that structure look like? I mean, there, it, it's never a one size fits all thing. So let's suppose someone gave you a pitch. You were like the company, mm -hmm. but they're like, yeah, we want, we have a $50 million valuation, right? Were you like, okay, dude, were you are like, they, are this, this is their first investment? First, first investment. Oh, would, you, would you be like, you know, okay. Oh, this guy has no clue. I'm not going to deal with them. Or would you try to coach a mentor? I'm like, hey, guy, like this is unrealistic. I always believe that if you want money, ask for advice. If you want advice, ask for money. Yeah. So I firmly believe that if a person came to me asking for $50 million as a first day or asking for $50 million like, valuation. Is your startup carrying cancer? <laughs> I'm like, what is it made of? Panda pee or something? <laughs> like, no, but I, I mean, I'm gonna give him advice. I'm gonna like, I'm, I was, I was the type of investor though I was quiet. Um, if I said no, I would tell you why. You know, most investors won't. They'll just say no. They'll just be like, okay, hey, your business is unfundable. But you're not gonna tell them why your business is unfundable. Me, I would tell you why. I'd be like, hey, I, I just don't. I'm just not seeing the product market fit. Hey, I think that you're over. You know, I think that you've placed this valuation too rich. Um, and ultimately, like, let's say that if I invested into this $50 million, like valuation, okay, well, who's going to be the next person? Like, how, like, how do I get out? Like, what's like, what's the pathway yeah. for me to get out of this investment? What does that look like? I mean, if, are you going to come in at a hundred million? Or are you going to come in at 200 million? Like, what does that look like? And so just really breaking it down for folks and like literally having those, those questions while we're going through the pitch. And then of course, if I say no. I would always give like my, my advice, whether or not you take it or leave it, like that's up to you, but I would rather like tell you, here's the reason why I said no. And then here's my advice for you um, moving forward. So as far as you invested, do you have any home runs? You just had a bunch of singles, so to speak. I've actually, I don't, I, well, it depends upon what you define as home run. None of them went public. Yes. <laughs> I think that's the ultimate home run, a company that goes public. Um, have I had some mini acquisitions here and there? Yeah. Um, were they enough to like literally say, okay, hey, like, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm stepping away. I'm about to go buy an island. <laughs> Probably not. Um, but no, I mean, it's, it's been pretty good. But then at the same token, it's just like, okay, hey, like for me, real talk, I didn't really do it for, I didn't really do it for the money. I did it because of the fact that I wanted to invest in great ideas that I wanted to see come into the, that wanted to, that I wanted to see come to fruition and grow. Um, and ultimately, you know, also in legacy, you know, for me, it's about legacy. Like even the thing at FTC, it's, it's all about legacy. I'll be able to sit back and tell my kid one day, um, Hey, your dad invested in that or your dad built that. So this is on a Twitter X2. I'm going to have you read this is predicts for beginning of the year. I'm happy. Oh that. God. And, and <laughs> would you keep that the same redo it or. Okay. So here's my thoughts for 2024 NASDAQ, uh, for 2024 NASDAQ to hit, uh, 18.75 to 19,000 S and P 500 reaches, uh, 51, uh, 5,000 to 5.1,000 expect some volatility early, uh, uh, around earnings top of the year. 
and also around elections starting late August. Fed cuts by 150 basis points. Around May, sleepers are Amazon, Intel, Google, FDN, uh, Merkel Insurance, uh, Ubi. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So, so, you, so you standing by that or you want to make some changes or? Oh, yeah, I definitely got to make some changes. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I was sub out Intel. Um, though that I believe that they they're coming forth, but if, if Intel is not going to be the the foundry for other chip companies, then I then I say no. I, I mean, Intel will just be there; it'll just be around. But I would sub out Intel for AMD. Um, Amazon, I still believe, based upon what is it that I know, um, I believe that their AI chip is going to be something that like people need to pay attention to. Um, so yeah, there's that. Um, I mean, I've, I mean, it surpassed what my expectations were for the S&P 500 because we're now at like 5,400, knocking on the door of 5,500 uh, for July. Fed cuts. I mean, of course, I'm at the mercy of the market as it pertains to inflation, so we didn't get that down. So, of course, we're probably going to have one rate cut and then probably have 100 basis point cuts in 2025. Uh, at NASDAQ, I still believe that we're probably going to hit that. I still believe that we're going to hit like 18,750. I still believe that that's possible. I think that Apple, Microsoft, and a few others are going to lead that. What's the company out there like people don't really know about? Like, I think people know about NVIDIA now. I'm sorry to say that wrong. What's the company out there like, like doing good things? No, you actually said it right. I did. A, a lot of people say NVIDIA, NVIDIA okay. which really grinds my gears. But go ahead. So what, what's the company out there like people don't know about, but you think it's going like, to really like, come to the forefront pretty soon? Um, I mean, companies that are non-public or public or publicly traded. Either, either one. Um, I think that you have a great deal of companies that are non-publicly traded, um, that are just sitting there in the private market that they should have gone public a long time ago, but they didn't. And I understand the reason why is because it's a liquidity problem. Um, like companies like Stripe, I think that they should have been gone public. Maybe for my own selfish reasons, because I own shares of it, but, yeah. but, um, but yeah, I mean, Companies that people should pay attention to. Let me pull up my handy dandy watch list uh, on the publicly traded market side real quick. Um, and yes, I have a very extensive watch list over here. Um, oh, look at that. Adobe shot up 14.7%. So I, I can't I can't put that on the table now because I was gonna say that and I was like, ugh. Um, Netflix. Honestly, people know about Netflix, but they know about it for a streaming video, but they don't really pay attention to its game. And I think that Netflix is in a position that like they spend a lot, but if they really want to make a play towards like really spending towards like, you know, stuff and going further, I think that they, they stand a good shot. I think that they stand a good shot as it pertains to acquiring like the Ubisofts and the EAs of the world. Um, let's see arm of course, cause they, they're the supplier of a lot of chips and of course, Tesla. Yeah. So um, <laughs> like, from our point of view, it's like never easy to raise money, right? Mm -mm. Even in 2020, even the given money away, it's hard to raise money. It's always hard to fundraise, right? Do you think that's going to change coming up anytime soon? Or is it always going to be a slug for these early stage founders, so to speak? I think it's going to be kind of like a challenge at first, but I think that we're getting more so into the part where it's like a lot of the funds are getting a little bit more, they're going to get a little bit more lax and you know, ultimately step it back a little bit, which thank you. I think I, know, I think after the whole Silicon Valley Bank situation where everybody was doing their bank run, I think that that kind of spooked the market and that sent shockwaves across the entire venture capital community. But also keep in mind from 2016 to 20, let's say 20, 2021, you know, a lot of the VCs were running like pretty fast and loose as it pertains to like, you know, signing term sheets and everything. I mean, the pandemic also didn't help because of the fact that you couldn't really be there, but you just had to, like, you know, ideas were still flowing, they were still raising capital. But the market has changed. I mean, variable change happens, and ultimately things change alongside with it. Um, and I think that with, you know, people getting a little bit more strenuous on their capital um, and, their, and their requirements of, like, what they're looking for for successful companies, I think that we'll, we'll we're, we're still in those tough innings but i think that we're getting ready to move out of it where it's like we get back and it's like okay coast is clear a lot of funds have raised their capital and now they're competing to ultimately lead rounds again um so i you know the ideas are going to keep flowing i think that we're going to ready to see like the flush of the early ai companies that weren't you know that were just 
nothing. Um, and then we're going to start seeing the real, the, the next phase of AI companies or next phase of startups that are just doing phenomenally well, that are well weathered and ready for capital. What advice do you have for founders where they're like early stage, have a product out there? Like what's your advice for them? I mean, traction, is, it's all about traction. I mean, there's, there's levels of traction. Like for example, the, the creme de la creme of traction would probably be if people are willing to give you their social, that type of data uh, that has high value. But then there's also like the lower tier where it's like they're willing to give you their name, their email, because it's so abundant out there. Um, but also if they're willing to give you data about themselves, uh, like things that are intricate, things that tell you a little bit more about who they are as a consumer, that, that carries weight. So focus on more so in the sense of, you know, really traction. Um, and everything tends to fall into place at that point. Like, you know, because when you reach that area of traction, it's like, okay, hey, it shows success. So I think on one side, you have people who tell you, you know, like, I'm kind of exaggerating. Yeah. Get hundred thousand dollars every more product market fit everything in thirty days right or don't or, or or don't do it right and other people say never quit. Ours has to be somewhere in the middle, right? Oh yeah, there's definitely a place in the middle. Like if you're showing that essentially that there's things that are just not happening, either you're going to need to pivot or you're just going to just need to say that this is a failure. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like there's nothing wrong. Like startups fall apart all the time. Like they go under all the time. The success rate as it pertains to startups being successful is not that high. No. Um, as it pertains to the creme de la creme of success. But, you know, when you get into the, you know, into the lower tier, like, you know, small acquisitions are still viable. They're doing well. I mean, you know, we kind of like poo poo and frown upon a million dollars in ARR or MRR if you're, if your business is doing that. But that's something that's fundable. Like that's just a matter of just like teaching somebody like, okay, Hey, you got a million dollars in, in revenue in a year. What were your profit margins? Like? Okay. Well now we're just making iterations and fine tuning. Like everybody, like, look, like you said, everybody's expecting the companies that they invest in to be like, you know, your NVIDIA's, your AMD's or your Amazon's your Apple's your Facebook's and everything else. And it's like their, their expectations are just too unrealistic. You have to remember, all big businesses were once upon a time small. Even Amazon, right? Even Amazon. <laughs> like, you know, now the whole idea of like, where all these startups start in their garage, <laughs> probably not yeah. anymore. I mean, but that's okay. Like, but, you know, they're not going to just come out of the gate, like, just like on track. You know, they're not going to just be like, okay, hey, well, we're, we're running the streets and everything else. No, they're going to they're gonna go through their challenges and everything else. And that's what you want. Like, you, you look forward to those things. So... Mark, can you talk about some of the people who have mentored you through the past? Oh, God, yeah. I mean, it's too many to count. One, <laughs> um, you know, from, you know, former professors to my grandfather, you know, my boss uh, at the last company that I ever worked for, Kaz. Um, you know, they one thing that I look for in my mentors is that they were all people that I aspired to, like, I, certain aspects about them. That I aspired to ultimately somewhat be like. So like for cause, like, you know, what he did on a, on a foundational basis for business. And then on top of that, what he did for the community, like that, that's big, you know, from, you know, a mentor of mine, who's a judge who focuses on like, you know, really, you know, mentoring young people. And also like, you know, those things taught me how to cultivate talent, you know, understanding that you're coaching talent. You know, how do you coach them? How do you ultimately help them to get better? Um, some of the folks that I know, like the VCs of the world that have done well, um, where I've sat in conversations with them, like the Mark Susters of the world, you know, like yeah, really I'm, good. I'm a big fan of his. He's, I mean, I'm a big fan of his. Like, solid. I, I, I probably get funny by him, but I just like the, the advice he puts out. He used to do these things called snap storms back in the day. Yes. Yeah. But like I'm a big fan of his. solid. Like the advice that he gives. And then on top of that, he's just down to earth. Yeah. Like, you know, it's like he doesn't think that he's like he knows it all at all. Like he's more like and those are the types of investors or the type of people that you want to surround yourself around. But they don't think that they know everything. But they, they realize, OK, hey, I, I may know some things, but I'm also still learning in this process as well. Like mentors learn from their from the folks that they mentor as much as the mentee learns from the mentor. So a follow-up question. To me, the more important part of the question, who are you mentoring right now? Oh God, too many. <laughs> too many. Like on the on the stock market side, I still mentor people. 
on the founder side on in the startup world, I mentor people. For the folks that are interested in getting into venture capital, like my goal is not to sway you from getting into it, but more so to understand like this is the game that you're stepping into. This is what the game looks like um, for founders. Like, you know, every single founder that's within our portfolio at FCC, I mentor them. Like I'm, my job is like though it says managing partner. It's more so I'm the CEO of CEOs because of the fact that as a CEO, you're con- you're constantly coaching. You're constantly instilling wisdom. You're constantly like helping your team get better um, and also helping solve problems along the way. So like, yeah, I'm like majority of my day is probably spent like 50% of it is spent mentoring people. Like where it's just sometimes just listening, being a soundboard. Um, and then the other part is like helping work through the problem. So the companies in under your, from the culture, are they all Seattle based across the United no, States? No, they're across the United States. Okay. So again, like, you know, I, when I set out on this mission, you know, and, and honestly, I didn't know where it was going to take me. So I just said, you know what, no matter where the journey takes me, I'm just going to be open to it. And these companies, they, they reach out to you, you reach out to these companies, like how does that work? They reach out to us. Okay. Like, I'm, I'm blessed in the sense that we don't have to do the whole sales. Is it like some kind of application process or obviously senior literally we, are, we, how's that work? How do you exactly, like we, yeah. we, that's why I said it's like FTC kind of like runs like a venture capital firm where it's just like, okay, hey, bring us the pitches. Like, you know, the other LPs there, they'll bring a pitch. They'll bring a founder my way. Say, hey, like, let's, let's talk to this person. Or, or, do you have the time to like literally meet with them? You know, first I'm like, okay, hey, do we have the capacity to bring yeah. another company underneath yeah. our portfolio? What does that look like? Because we're making the investment into their company as it pertains to many times they're not paying for the development costs. We are. What is your capacity? 20 companies, 30 companies? So currently in our portfolio right now, we have 16. Okay. We have 16 companies in our portfolio and growing. Okay. I think that when it's all said and done, we'll probably have about maybe 40 to 60. And what all do y'all provide? Software development, okay. business development, preparing for fundraising. Um, we don't get into the HR part, but we know some people that are pretty dope there. <laughs> um but yeah, I mean, and then on top of that, surrounding like legal around them, giving them all the necessary things that they need to be able to succeed. I mean, we introduce them. We have a very vast network of folks that are outside of our firm that work with us. And then on inside of our firm, we have folks that, that have been there before or that have seen parts of the journey. Can you like highlight or talk about a couple of them? Not yet, okay. <laughs> but in, Ju- in July, okay. I will. Okay. I-, I will be doing uh, quite the reveal. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I will say that they they range from sports, um, finance, AI, of course, um, consumer, and enterprise. And you do like they give you like rookie updates, monthly updates. Well, I talk to them like all the time. So okay, <laughs> like you so know, literally, they're, they're little, sitting in a little Slack. Little. They're sitting in the Slack. So essentially, like you know, I'm you know, each company is the channel in our in our firm. So you know, I'm I'm seeing what's happening. I'm seeing from their conversations that they're having. So is there a company you took on? Like how to put this, like suppose a company reach out to you and you and your mind like, man, there's no way I do I'll, I'll work with them, right? Like somehow they convince you to yeah. take a chance on them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean it's happened. And okay. and and it's and, and we've also had like a company that we've worked with where it's just like, okay, after we've worked with them, it's just like, okay, it's not working. Yeah. This is not gonna work out. Um, and so how is it that we make the best of it? How is it that we prepare the founders so that way they can transition? You know, if it means that we're not going to be on this journey with them. What characteristics do you think make up a quote unquote good founder or great founder? Teachable, um, explorer, um, and then on top of that, a person who wish that like literally, we're not looking for like, I understand hustle culture is like the part where you work yourself tired now, but we're more so in the sense of with the hustle in the sense that, you know, they live for the business. They live for the idea and they want to solve it. How long does it take for you to figure that out? It's like a couple of meetings, 30 days, 20 days, you pretty much tell right Typically, off the bat. I tend to find out like from folks, like the questions that I ask is like, you know, I tend to find out fairly quickly. Um, you know, like there's certain questions that you can ask a founder that they just can't, that, you know, as much if they don't know it or whatever it is, you just can't dance around it. So as a founder, you have to know a lot of stuff, right? Yeah. What's like, pose those 10 things you want your founders to know. What's the one thing where like, okay, you don't know this, that's okay, right? I can work with that. I mean, business model. Like, you know, a lot of times, like, you know, we expect founders to know their business model, but sometimes the business model doesn't work and ultimately leads you into a place where you have to go and like literally pivot. Mm -hmm. 
So business model is one of those things where it's just like, we can sacrifice that. Yeah, I see so many people like that's the number one thing, business model, like how do I make money? Yeah. No, I mean, the, the number one thing is like the value proposition, like the value proposition model for like, okay, hey, is this like, is this showing pathway to viability? Like, is there a pathway that people will actually want to utilize this product or service? And what's the value for them? And then what's the one thing that, that your founders have to have? Like, you don't have this, I can't, I can't do business. The one, the one thing they need to have. Dedication. You know, dedication. You got to be dedicated. Like, if so you're not dedicated, I, then how can you expect my firm? So how does someone prove that to you? Show me. Like, you know, show me that you're dedicated to it. Like, the, every founder that has come to my stage, like, to our desk and sat down and talked to us, you know, I, I sit back and ask you, like, what is it that you've done so far? Like, what are some of the necessary steps that you've done to, like, literally make your business viable or to put your business in a specific position? What have you done? Um, and if they tell me, like, and it's like, okay, hey, show me. And if I see it, then great. Like, now I know that you're dedicated towards it. It's like you're working 40 hours a week at this company that pays you. But at the same token, you're putting an X amount of hours here yeah. to make this a reality. Like, that matters. Like, if you're not making, if you're not putting the necessary time and you're just waiting on us to literally build the idea for you to make it a reality, we could build you the, the greatest product. But if you don't have the business behind it, and if you don't show the dedication behind it, then why should anybody else? So obviously there's a lot of people that are going to start advice, right? Mm -hmm. Some good, mm -hmm. a lot of it not so good, right? How should our founder like go about as far as like picking and choosing what advice to follow or not follow? I mean, more so in the sense of like, okay, hey, like don't make it, don't take it personal. What's in the best interest of the business? Um, and what they're telling me, is it in the best interest of my business? Like one of the things I also learned is, when people get advice, one of the things that I do when it comes to advice, and a lot of my our, our founders at FTC will tell you, <laughs> they're like, Mark helps me solve my own problem by majority of the time just asking me questions. So I spend very little time giving advice. I spend more time asking questions. You like to like help them reframe their mind thoughts, so to speak? I'm just asking them the questions that ultimately just allows them to just like think about it in the sense of like, okay, well, why is this not working? Or what is it that what is it that the data is trying to show me? You know, and I, I tend to find that founders will figure it out for themselves. You tend to find that um, companies start with co-founders or more successful ones with like solo founders, or that doesn't really matter. <laughs> it 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 depends. Okay. It depends. Like, you know, some companies they can flourish with just one founder, and then other companies, like, you know, but at, at the same token, I always give the advice to folks in the sense of just like my my two cents. I'm like, hey, if something were to happen to you, though, how does the business continue? Yeah. And so if you're coming to an investor and asking them for capital, they're probably thinking the same thing. Like, OK, if he gets hit by a car, God yeah. forbid, what happens to the company that I just invested into? What's the plan? So, I mean, yeah, having founders is, is not only just a redundancy thing, but it's somebody that you can also bounce ideas off of that gives you an, like that gives you ideas outside of just like what's in your own head. Um, so, yeah, there, we, we know the advantages of having multiple founders, but then there's some cases where you have a solo founder and they're just a rock star and they just yeah. knock it out of the park. So. so how come this doesn't happen? And maybe it does. I don't know about it. So a, a startup founder gets funded, right? Pose like they get, we'll say $2 million, right? Yep. What keeps them from like, going to the Philippines or going to Thailand, let's take the money and run it right. Is like laws against that? Like, like what keeps that from happening? Uh, Besides, you know, integrity and honesty, all that kind of stuff, you know? I mean, yeah, I mean, that's the main thing. Yeah. But I would say like- I'm just uh, surprised it doesn't happen more, I'll be honest with you. I mean, yeah. I mean, of course, I have a cynical view on people, so. Well, and also the world has become so much smaller. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, you can't hide no more, right? You can't really hide no more. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's kind of like the, the written code of just yeah. like, you know, $2 million in a big scheme of things really is not a lot of money. It's not, it's not. I mean, but when you think about it, it's just like the code of just like, you know, Hey, like if you're really true to what it is that you're doing, then yeah. essentially you're not going to try to run numbers. Now, of course there have been companies that got acquired by publicly traded companies <laughs> and ultimately like it was a complete, yeah, nothing burger. Um, but again, it's like, you know, all investments, all businesses risk, I mean, and they should be treated in the form yeah. in which that they're supposed to. So next move on, you're doing this summit in July, right? Yeah. So let's talk about it real fast. So I have, your, I have your website right now. Yeah. 
Um, anything you want me to go and talk about? Or... Yeah, feel free. Go, okay. Go, go. Um, so your speakers, you're the Alex Kino speaker. One of them, yeah. So how do you pick these speakers? Are people you already know or? People that I know. So Kofi, he's the head of TXO at A16Z. Okay. So they're talent and That's, opportunity. Um, man, what's that? Um, man, I can't think of the real name for them. Andreessen Howard. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So I met him when I went to speak in New Orleans. Um, very phenomenal guy doing some pretty good work with startups and founders. Um, now, these people like you have to pay them a fee to speak for you or no, like... they're all doing it because of the fact that they okay. want to be there. Okay. Um, Philip Jacobs, he focuses on like, you know, like really like pressing the, you know, the uncomfortable conversations within corporate. There's of course, Evan Ponsolet who's doing things at DreamWork group, Renee Pierce, uh, Peters, who's doing some pretty cool work at, uh, NVIDIA. He'll be speaking with Dennis and Antoine Flowers. Hey, random right guy right here. And you know, Hey, <laughs> <laughs> nah, but he, I mean, Dennis is cool. He, he's super cool. Uh, Tiara Swain, she focuses on, she can speak towards the recruitment, uh, not only just within like startup space, but just tech and all, overall. And these people, like, did you tell them what you want to speak on or they just come to you and say, well, I, get, I gave them the idea as it pertains to the general premise, but ultimately like, you know, they're about it. Like, okay. And they're talking like 30 minutes, an hour. or just So each, minutes. so each session is going to be about 45 minutes to okay. an hour. Um, but yeah, so, um, is anyone speak on here that you're excited to, to hear from? Oh, man, I'm excited to hear from all of them. Like, you got Wall Street folks that are there, like Mark Mahaney from Evercore ISI and Christopher Bush, who does, who has a, he started a hedge fund that I was, you know, helping advise. And he's also a fellow Sigma as well. Okay. So I think you'll like that. But, you know, he manages, what is it, uh, close to $200 million in AUM. And where's this going to be at? At University of Washington Foster School. So we got all three buildings of the okay. Foster School of Business. And that's where Startup Hall is at, or is that something different? So that's Founders Hall. Um, they, we got Founders Hall, Dempsey, and Takar Hall. So, yeah. And remember correctly, 90% of, of, of the money is going to go is like some... Um, 100%. 100%. 100% of the proceeds. So all ticket sales and all sponsorship goes towards nonprofits. So we're going to focus on Down Syndrome uh, Center, um, African American Leadership Forum, and then also providing to Burke because they've been influential of opening their doors to us. And don't you have a partnership with them now? Uh, yeah, and also apparently I'll be sitting on the board uh, soon for University of Washington Foster School or Burke Center of Entrepreneurship. So, oh, shit. yeah, <laughs> more people to mentor. I guess so. So talk about the startup speed pitch. So startup speed pitch is like pretty much each founder or each startup is given five minutes to pitch to VCs in the room. And then you move on to the next one. Okay. And at the end, if they want to like literally carry on a, an extended conversation after that, we welcome that. Like, that's what it's about. Like people that come to this event from high, low, um, we want them to be able to like literally be able to sit down and have those conversations with venture capitalists. And then also let the VCs know that there's other talent that's coming out there. Yeah. So I know I, you have an application process on this website, yep. Pitch Deck. Yep. Like, how, how are you going to go about choosing? Like, suppose you get a thousand startups. Uh, we've gotten we've gotten quite a few. And, you have, and like, we, we still don't discourage anybody from pitching. Okay. Like, you know, five minutes goes by pretty fast. Mm -hmm. um, even if it means that you're only able to pitch three startups, mm -hmm. um, we'll probably make the pitches available afterwards uh, on the site or something like that. But, I mean... We go through a simple process of just like doing the verification of like, you know, the startup the same way that we do here at FCC. I mean, we're not judging you in the sense of like, you know, hey, even if we may not invest in it, there's somebody out there that would invest in it. We just want to make sure that they're fundable or that they're they're on a pathway. And some of the startups, they may just be there just for advice. Um, who's like, I also want everyone to come, but do you have like a, like a, Perfect person you want to come, like an early stage startup founder, someone wants to raise, like, it's for everybody, money. early stage to okay. like Series B, or even if they work at a publicly traded company. If you're an investor, if you want to learn about the stock market, you can do that too. I'm bringing those two worlds together, mm -hmm. technically three worlds because venture capital as well. So you got high net worth and you're thinking about like diversifying your portfolio. You already are in the stock market, but maybe you want to invest into becoming an LP at a, at a venture capital firm or know what it takes to start your own firm. There's that. Um, and then for startups to meet founders or even meet VCs and possibly even have a term sheet uh, on the way. Um, that's the overall objective of this event. And for the tickets, does it include interest fee, like three meals a day? What does the ticket actually Yeah, so the, the event will be catered. Um, so we'll have food there to, to cater some of it. We do want our 
a guest to also go visit Seattle. Like that's that's one of the things that we also like stress. Like go the, visit the Marriott Seattle. Hotel. Which Marriott is this? That's the one in the U District. So we may have to like focus on getting some more rooms because apparently I just found out that they're all booked up now. Okay. <laughs> so we'll see if we can get more rooms. Um, we we had a a lot of folks that were booking up the space, and we had a great partnership with them. So we'll see what we can do. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's for everybody. So what's your goal for this? Like, what's your metric success? Like, metrics to success is like, where are there any companies that ultimately built relationships with VCs? We'll follow up with our startups that came to the event. Um, we'll start up. We'll also follow up with the VCs. Like, hey, you know, did you did you find any good companies? Of course, you know, we'll be watching in the room of seeing like, okay, hey, on the investor side, you know, what did that look like? Connections that were being built. You know, we see all those things. We we see some of those same metrics that, with the come up series. You know, people have been asking me to do this event for three years now, and now it's just like, okay, hey, it's it's finally here. Is this being live stream also, or you have to be in person to do? You it? have to be in person, okay. but we're kind of like thinking about like possibly making it available for folks Maybe to watch like it, you know, it or something. Yeah, watching the recording of this event. Um, and so we'll we'll think about that. But for now, it's like we they've asked us to do a live event, so this is live. Okay. Um. Anything else you want to talk about? This anything you want to highlight or for the for the summit? Yeah, um, I mean, get your tickets. <laughs> get your tickets. Like, you know, you're gonna want to know. Like, you're, you'll. This is one of those events. Like, you know, I know that we got Seattle a lot of like tech weeks and stuff like that here in Seattle. And then this week was the AI week here. This in was Seattle. AI week, and then we'll have like another one which is like climate tech or something yeah, like that. Week. And then we'll have like this event was before the actual Seattle Tech Week um, that that kicks off. But this is different. This is different because most of those tech weeks that you normally see here in Seattle is the same people. Yeah. This is going to be different because you're going to have people that are coming from different parts of the world, not only just here in the U.S., but from places like London, Ghana. Um, and so, like I said, it's, it's going to be pretty cool. For your sponsors, who's this right here? I've never heard of them before. So Bar Chart, that's actually the platform that I used when I first started trading. Um, where they, I didn't trade on the platform, but it was where I got a lot of my technical analysis and I used it. Um, for like news and technical analysis, charting. And so they've been with me since my entire journey um, as a trader. Come August, I'll be 20 years in the game as okay. a trader. And um, this right here? That's yeah. Love Resource Development Group. Um, that's by Ruby Love. Okay. Um, and then Nola Bate Black, that's uh, Sabrina Short. So where she focuses on um, and this Black is Tech your, Founders, that's FTC and then that's the your, right. series. Okay. Yep. And then I, that's I the Sin, VC, Kirby Winfield. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then Foster School of Business through Burke Center of Entrepreneurship. Um, We're also open to more sponsors if they want to sponsor as well. How? Now, not a lot of people going to use public transportation. How long is this from like the Link Rail Station in the University of Washington? Is it within walking distance? You know? Yeah, this like the the light rail station in UW right is there. now there. So okay. yeah, you could just like literally get off and just go walk to the to the to the university. Now for the schedule, so like, post someone can only go like to the first day. So the first day is like the kickoff. So okay. Friday is the kickoff. And so that's where it's like, you know, I'll probably give a keynote. And then after that, it's just a mixer. Welcome to the city. You'll have myself, uh, Dean Foster, uh, and then Amy Sullen from Burke. And then, of course, the city of uh, city of Bellevue, Mayor uh, Dr. Lynn Robinson. Now, are you going to have like different things going on at the same time? Like, yeah, person speaking. Yeah. So like we'll have sections where they're just keynote, where they're just general events, like general audience. So everybody comes in. And then we'll have workshops and we put it on, if you scroll up, there's an investor track and then there's an entrepreneur's track. And those events can take place okay. at around the same time. Okay. And so you can pick and choose which event that you want to attend. So it's, you're not locked into okay. any, of the, any of the events. So what do you want people to get out of this? Suppose someone attends all three days. What do you want them to get out of this? I want them to like literally like... When you're done with this event, you should actually have action, actionable steps that you need to take in order to make your startup move or to like literally move forward in your investment journey. Um, and then on top of that, having a better understanding of the knowledge that's in front of you, understanding market, understanding what's happening in the startup space, and then also understanding how VCs truly work and what they're looking, what they're looking for. The VCs that are coming to speak, no bullshit. Like, it's literally like, we're going to ask you questions. Yeah. Like, what companies are you investing in? Like, what is it that you're looking for? What is that secret formula? Or what is that formula that takes that 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 takes you from, you know, okay, hey, I'm listening to a yes or no. Um, same thing for the publicly traded markets. Um, so, again, it's it's giving you all different types of data. And this is your first time doing this? 
this is my first time ever putting on this event and people are asking me about next year's event yeah i'm gonna ask you like what kind of what what has to happen at this event for you to say okay i'm doing this next year uh god has to say like mark do it again (laughs) but no all, all jokes aside um i don't know i mean let me get through the first one first. Okay. And, you know, we may have to have a comeback episode for me to like talk about it. But this is something that like literally we've only had six. We've only pl- we put this together in six months. Yeah. And people don't realize like that's not a short amount of time it's, to do something like this. That's like literally like we yeah. started putting this again, this event together. In all these speak, all these speaks out to deal with the schedules, I'm sure. Exactly. You know, and, like, you know, I'm sure you probably had like several different dates you had to go through. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. People and so people don't realize, people take the events that's happened. No. Yeah. See, normally, normal events like this normally takes a year to plan. We literally started planning this event and putting it together from the ground running starting in mid May, uh, mid, not mid May, mid February. That's when we got started. So, with tickets, is it like different price for students, for startups? Students are free. Okay. Uh, startups pay the same general pricing as everybody else. Okay. If you want to have a booth, it's like $500. Okay. Um, we could probably throw a discount in there for that one. Um, but again, I mean, general admission is $150 a ticket. Okay. So that comes out of 50 bucks a day. And I'm assuming you're not going to have like freaking, you know, churches fried chicken as a catering, right? Oh, absolutely. I'm pretty not. sure. No, no, no. I'm pretty sure that this, you know me well I'm enough to know sure, I'm a foodie. I'm pretty sure the food alone is be worth more than $50 a I'm day. I'm a foodie. I'm a foodie. Like, you know, sure we're going to have, alone. Jerk, we're going to have jerk shack there. Yeah. Uh, the food alone is going to be worth more than $50 a day. God. Yeah. God. Yeah. Um, we are literally like, I'm a foodie at heart. You know, I, I expect good food. Um, and so I went and this is like a, re- if people are coming to visit my, our city for the first time, I want them to experience like good food, good culture, so good, good things. The people flying in, like, yep. did you have to pay for the flights or they did that on their own dime or the speakers? Yeah. No, they, like I said, they're, they're alone. Okay. Like, look, this was one of those ones where it's like, Hey, everybody come outside. Mm-hmm. And they came outside and like, they're like, Hey, like, like I'm I'm with this. You're like, like no, I'm Mark Moreau. <laughs> oh my God. I'm Mark Moreau. I, I guess you could say that, <laughs> but more so in the sense that it's like I you know, Mark Moreau. There you go. I uh, am Mark but, I'm doing this event. But more so it's like they, they see the cause behind it too. Mm-hmm. And they they understand like, okay, this has significant meaning and this hasn't been done before. Like we've seen other events like it, but when I like go through the full rubric of like really what it gives you, the all encompassing, yeah. So why Friday through Sunday still like Monday through Wednesday? I just wanted to give people the weekend. Weekend, okay. And then on top of that, to have the buildings, we don't have to worry about all the other hoopla that's yeah, going on. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So like for those three buildings alone, I mean, to have those for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and we get it till whenever we, we leave. So y'all, y'all, y'all have any like after 5 p.m. entertainment? Uh, there, there's, there's possible for a mix there. <laughs> there. There's definitely possible for a mixer. So we did an early bird. And so those early birds are VIPs. Mm-hmm. We may bring it back on next week mm-hmm. for a flash sale. Mm-hmm. So that way, if they want to participate and like, you know, sit down with the speakers and everything else and like, you know, have more intimate conversations, uh, we'll make those available again. Mm-hmm. Um, but for the most part, it's, this is, I, I honestly believe that if I, I, if I ever, Dreamed of putting together an event. This is what exactly what it would look like. Okay, nice. All right. So next, next question, right? Yeah. So people are talking about like the disparity between like any kind of well-off people, kind of poor people, right? Mm-hmm. Disadvantages. Mm-hmm. But what about like suppose, suppose someone lives in like you know, we'll say the central district in Seattle, yep. right? Yep. They're not well off. They have access to all the stuff, all the tech stuff in Seattle, right? Yep. Then you have someone who lives in like you know bumfuck Arkansas on a farm with 20 people, right? No access to tech, right? Okay. Isn't a person in Seattle actually like better off as far as he has access to stuff? You know, he might be poorer than a person in Arkansas. So the lack, lack the, to the tech and of course there's Zoom and stuff like that, you know? It just, are you talking about like the ecosystem that surrounds yeah. him? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, like you see like in ecosystems that are trying to do better and everything else. And it's just like, uh, what can you do? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where it really comes into the play where it's just like the ecosystem has just got to get better. Um, you know, we even see it with companies that have great ideas and yet, you know, the talent for the early stage is good, but then outside of early stage, they're struggling. And the reason why is because it's like, okay, hey, what, where do you find that next talent tier? You're not going to find them in that same geographical location. When it comes to opportunities, opportunities are plentiful, but who are those opportunities for? Yeah. And cities have a, 
cities sometimes do a bad job of leaving behind the folks in whom wish that it like literally are like native there. Um, and so I think that that, if we, if we focus on literally making the opportunities, if the opportunities are plentiful, but if we make them available for the folks in whom wish that are here, and then, you know, then it's like, okay, hey, like use it as a recruitment tool to like show everybody else, like, hey, that this is the reason why I got to take this call. This okay. Away. Okay. Uh, hello. Hey. Yeah, I'm in, I'm in the middle of a podcast interview. All right. And also, I'm glad that she called because my parking. Fired. Let's see if it. I parked down here on. You know the one thing I hate. Eight six one one zero. Eight six. I have to like cheat the system. Yeah, I usually play like parking street um, poker, you know. It says you can't extend your parking due to parking restrictions. What? Hmm. Seattle has definitely changed. <laughs> 86110. So up to two hours is time limit. Okay. So do I have to let it expire and then park again? Yeah, I've never seen anyone do it. You say just get on the phone and, and redo it. Okay, so it just expired. I mean, if I just get a ticket, I just... They can't tow it. This is the part about Seattle I don't miss. <laughs> How often do you come to Seattle? I come to Seattle like maybe like twice a week. Okay. Like to drop off my wife. Um payment is not accepted at this time. Parking advisory. Yeah, I've never heard that before. For more information, please check signage. Huh. Yeah, if I just get Okay. Whatever. Cool. Um so what's a skill you don't have that you want to learn? Huh. What's a skill that I have that I want, uh, that I don't have that I want to learn? Skill that I don't have that I want to learn. I want to learn how to swim. You know how to swim? I do not know how to swim. That's kind of... Enjoy it. <laughs> I just thought you know how to swim, man. No, I do not. I do not. I do not know how to swim, and it's like very I, embarrassing. I don't know why I thought you knew how to swim. Uh, and if it's not swimming, the other thing that I want to learn how to do is, I don't know. I think that that's the major thing. I want to. I want to learn how to swim. I can remember this wrong, but didn't your grandparents like build a school in Alabama or something? Oh God, no. Uh, no. no, no, they they didn't build no school. My no. grandmother was from Selma, Alabama. Okay, and she literally moved all throughout her life because okay. she was the military. She also. Okay. Lived in Germany. Okay. Um, my grandfather's from New Orleans, so and okay. maybe they did some stuff with the Black Panther Party yeah. um, on schools, but I don't think they built. I want to build a school. Okay. I'm sure you will one day. You know, it's possible. I mean, let some of these acquisitions go through with FTC. I'm I'm building a school. Here's here's one for you. Like just a few years ago, like so, I go to this thing called New Tech Northwest, right? This guy named. Um, Damn, what's his name? Damn, Greg Green runs it, right? Okay. And so, like, people pitch whatever. At the beginning, he'll always say, if, you, if you're looking for a job, stand up, right? You know, back in the day, like, no one would stand up and look for a job, right? But all the companies would really stand up and say, I'm looking for developers, right? Yeah. Because back then, you know. They needed them. Yeah. About a month ago, same thing happened. Who's looking for a job? 40 people stood up. 40 developers stood up looking for a job. Yeah. No one is hiring, right? How did this switch happen so fast? Because the uh, the market changed, like you had so many like developers became plentiful, mm -hmm. and the jobs started to become few. <laughs> um, 
and I think you're talking about like just recently, right? Yeah. Like so, like we saw a massive amount of like layoffs within the tech space, and so there was a flushing of talent mm -hmm. in the tech space, and then a lot of them were out looking for jobs. Yeah. Now you know a lot of them have joined startups and everything else. Like that's typically what happens when you get this massive outflow of the publicly traded companies, large companies, and it ultimately trickles its way on down to startups. Would you advise somebody to become a developer in this day and age? I think it, you, they should try to do something else. Like out of college? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I out mean, of college, what the case may be. Or just period? Yeah. I mean, if you have the if you have the knack for it, by all means. There's so many different parts of the of the landscape. You could be a software engineer. You could be an AI engineer, where you focus on AI models and machine learning. Um, you could be a data scientist. I mean, there's so many different arenas now that are now more open to people that you don't have to just go in one specific direction. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, but. So from your point of view, talk about some of the pros and cons of being an entrepreneur. <laughs> uh, which one should I take first? <laughs> uh, let's take the pros. I mean, you get to work on something that you wake up every day excited about. Um, every day is going to be you solving a problem like a puzzle. You get to work with some pretty cool people because, of course, they're, they're people that you've chosen to work with. Um, you're excited to solve such problems. And then, of course, you don't you know where a journey could take you, but you don't know like the twists and turns. So it's just like it's something new every day versus the everyday mundane task of doing the same thing over and over and over again. Um, the cons. <laughs> you know where your revenue is coming from, but you don't know if it's coming tomorrow. Um, you're going to take a lot of ambiguity and risk and risk it all and make some significant sacrifices as it pertains to like life. Um, things that you won't be able to do like because of the fact that you're drawn to this, especially if you're working a nine to five and being an entrepreneur. But um, the stress... <laughs> the stress, the emotional ups and downs of being an entrepreneur. Um, yeah, those are just a few of that. And like the, you're trying to validate an idea and it hasn't been validated yet. The building of the idea, but it's like, okay, hey, like the problems, the bugs, the, you know, the constant challenges. But again, some of those can just be a positive once you solve them. Yeah, I joke around that you should have to take some kind of mental health test before you become an entrepreneur. Yes, I think that you should. Yeah. I think that like everybody should like literally get it like, or when you start it, just get checked. Like, yeah. just, just go. Like, hey, am I fit for this? You know, do I have the stomach for this? Because a lot of folks, you know, they have ideas and they want to bring it forth, and I welcome it. it. It's always great in theory, but then it becomes that other part to it where it's just like, ugh, yeah. it's stressful. So, do you want to do another drink? Are you good? Um, I could do a slight little drink. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what are we doing? Are we doing the same one? It's totally up to you. I mean, that one was good. Okay, so totally, totally up to you. What, what else do you have that's like that one? Uh, the rest of them are bourbons. Okay, well, I know you're a bourbon guy, so I'll, I'll join you in your world. You pick one. Um, let's try this Angel Envy. I never had it. Everyone says it's All right, good. so, well, this we in your house. So you yeah. Sir. So I'm doing this. Talk about this, right? Talk about the importance of, like, your spouse, your partner, whatever the case may be, being supportive of your entrepreneurial journey. Oh, God, yeah. I mean, I mean, that's... Being being an entrepreneur is just like being in a marriage. Like when you sign a when you sign on to be a founder, you're you're literally in a full fledged relationship. You know, there's like the ups and downs and everything else that go with it. You're you're just you're stuck. Um, the good, the bad, the ugly, and the beautiful. You just have to go with it. Um. Having a partner that understands that or that is willing to support you through that craziness and masochism <laughs> is huge. You know, I've had relationships in which that with people that I've dated and the relationship was just not going to work out because of the fact that they wanted to, me to either choose them or the startup. <laughs> and uh, we know how that played. Okay, I'm going to have what way less than yours <laughs> yeah i've never had this one before but everyone says it's really good though it looks it looks very very good all right so i i think i may have like i don't know what i've just like stumbled into because of the fact that uh this has wings on the back <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, don't fly away. <laughs> hopefully i don't fly away or something like that or like i don't find myself in trouble 
So this is Angel's Envy. Yeah. Okay. All right. Cheers again, my friend. Cheers, brother. And also, I think a lot of times startup founders miss up. Like, obviously, you're going to tell your thinking of other, right? I think a lot of people miss up and don't tell That's their true. friends, right? Like, they don't tell your friends, hey, I won't be able to like, hang out with you anymore, right? Yeah. I'm doing this, right? No. And the friends, you know. Because you ride on that emotional high when you first start working out on an idea. The citrus taste is everything. There. Oh, man. The citrus yeah, taste. right? <laughs> I know. Mm, I mean, I'm... all right, Angel's Envy. All right, Angel's Envy. And, okay, you're putting me onto some serious game here. All right, so. But, yeah, I mean, you're so excited that you just, like, forget, like, it's kind of like oh man i'm working on this idea and everything else just like like kind of like time just stands still and i'm just focused on like just building all this other stuff then it's just like reality comes back and it's just like hey you got friends that you haven't even seen or talked yeah. to none of that like and it's just it's just part of the process that's what people don't realize too i joke around too like n none of us can hire a first assistant like elon musk right like mm -mm. i mean hopefully you start taking baths i mean hopefully you start taking care of your car doing laundry right yeah I mean, you still, if you're married, you got responsibilities to your wife, you know? Yep. Like, and all that takes time, you know? Good old butter. Come lay down. Lay down. So, what should, from your point of view, like, suppose there's three co-founders, right? Yeah. And, like, the typical hackster, hipster, whatever you want to call it, yep. the different roles. What should, their, like, their first five hires be, like? Developers, marketing, sales, designer, like in best case scenario, they can and they, they, got, they got funding, they can hire whatever they want. Yeah. What's the first five hires? Well, it all starts, all problems are always solved within design. Like, you know, great design, not only just in the sense of pretty images, but in the sense of how it's flushed out, like how the idea is flushed out, literally is solved in design. If you don't solve it there, then you're just going to have a ton of headaches and, and hurdles and, so many and everything else that wrong, with it. They? and they make that wrong so many people how to develop they know how to design her. exactly um and so there's that part once you make it like so here's the how how it goes so you go through design and then ultimately you go through and then once the design is finalized something that okay hey this is good let's we can move forward on it now we move it over to all right we have this thing where we have our developers start working on the back end mm -hmm. and they can build the services of what is it that that what was designed these are the features then it's like okay you come back and you need a front-end developer to literally tie those those two things together and those two those two folks are working in tandem front-end engineer is working on like bringing those designs to life back-end engineer is writing the services and then front-end engineer ties those services together that's literally how most of your most of your your software is naturally written um and they're just following the specifications and guidelines from your designer. If you don't have those things, you're dead. Okay. You're just dead in water. Because then you're just going to be spinning your wheels over and over. Yeah. And there's a lot of times when people will spend $150,000 to a firm to go out there and do it. And it's just like, okay, we just spent $150,000, $200,000 for them to do it. But then it's just like, are they going to still stick around with us? Because yeah. it's not like you know how to do this stuff. Yeah. So it's just like, are you going to hire somebody in the interim while that's happening? It's like there's so many different combinations. But again, it's like it all starts at design. Okay. It all starts at design. And what's your take on, like, a lot of people say, I'll make this up again. Like, if you're a founder, you need to do the first sales for the first 10,000 MOR or something, right? Mm -hmm. But what if that's not your skill set, right? Then find somebody. Okay. Like, as a founder, you don't need to take on all this. Like, there's some things that you're going to have to figure out. Some things you will have to figure out. Mm -hmm. But then in other arenas, it's like, okay, hey, if you're not a developer, then you're the business. And it's on you to ultimately not only build the business, but also find people that can help you build the business. You can't do all this by yourself. Like, if not, you'll just go angry and you'll be mad. <laughs> um, and the overall objective is, is that when you do these things, it's also in the sense of how you challenge people around you, how you build a team. And that's going to speak volumes about you in the sense of how you built such a team. Um, so, I mean, honestly, it's like, you know, when I hear about founders, like, well, I got to do this, I got to do that. And then you got your team sitting on the sidelines. It's like, okay, well, yeah. And I made those mistakes before. Like, I made those mistakes fatally um, in the sense of like, okay, hey, well, 
I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to do this. And meanwhile, my team is just in the sideline like, okay, well. I'm collecting equity or I'm what, collecting something. What am I supposed to do? Yeah. Like, and, and it can be sometimes a kill like to the, to the culture of, of the startup or to the company. Um, so yeah, I, I, I always believe that find people that are smarter than you, hire people that are smarter than you or bring people on that are smarter than you to be able to execute. And you got to trust them. Once you bring them on, you trust them to be able to execute the idea. Do you think you'll ever start another startup? Look, FTC is a startup. Okay, and, that's your startup. Okay. And, okay. and trust me, okay. I'm done after okay. it. Like, however long it goes as, as it pertains to how many companies that we are in the, that we've had the privilege to serve, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to enjoy this run. But then after that, it's just like, you know, I want to go on to the next thing, which is I want to build a school. Build a school. I want to build a school. That's going to be a startup within itself. So <laughs> every new idea that you come forth with that yeah. you have to like literally flush out and literally find the pieces that surround it in order to like get things going and then also like get it off the ground. That's a startup. So talk about your process, like finding the right people to work with, whether it's a startup or FTC, like how do you like, pick and choose, so to speak, the people you want around you to help you build what you're building. You know what the business needs. I mean, you start with what is the business need? What is the business need? What does the team need? And then from there, you work your way, you work your way either forward or you work your way backward, depending on where you are in this, in this grand scheme of things. But it's just like, okay, hey, well, what does the team need right now? Like, you know, what is it, need, what is it that we need moving forward? You know, is this gonna be something that's gonna be repetitive over a period of time that we're gonna consistently need? And if that's the case, and we we need to find somebody that's not here just for a one-off, but somebody that's going to be able to stick around and somebody that enjoys doing this on a regular. For your for the summit you do in July, what's the max capacity for that? Like, what's your like like two hundred people can attend? Six hundred people. Six hundred people. Yeah. And you're like you pretty are, are you on like on the pathway to meeting that meeting that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm like I said, I know you're gonna have to turn people away. I hope not. Okay. <laughs> I hope not. That would kill me. Uh, students are free. So it's like, you know, like I said, this it's a mission focus for us, like in the sense of like really just trying to make sure that the ecosystem gets better. Um, but yeah, that would really suck if I have to turn people away. And I know it's on your website, it's on your in Facebook, Instagram, but what other ways are you, are you advertising this? Like you doing like social media blasts? Are you, are you relying on all the speakers social to push it out? Yeah, so our speakers are going to start pushing it out soon. Um, and then of course our sponsors as well. Um, and then, of course, like going to talk with individual groups like, you know, Venture Scale, all these other places, you know, just making sure that they're aware that this is happening in your own backyard. Is there any like any like hackathons that are going on through these three days? Yeah, there is a hackathon. There's okay. a hackathon and the winner gets a, gets prize money. Okay. To, to start the company. Is that that's application on the website also? Or? No, there's no application for the okay. hackathon. It's going to be people that you meet at the event. Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So what inspired me from that was uh, Greg Gottesman when he started Rover, and then Rover went on to be a publicly traded company. That was started at a at a at an event like this. Okay. Who who do you have judges for the hackathon? Yeah. Already. Are you you want you, you want to be a judge? Yeah, I'll be a judge. <laughs> I'll be a judge. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I like that kind of shit. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll have you as a judge. Okay. All right. You heard it first, Jason. Yeah. I don't know which camera I'm looking at. <laughs> Jason will be a judge. That'd be fun. Yeah. The one thing like. I cannot be imagine like being an investor having to decide what to invest in, right? Because you have limited money and there's all like, like oh, it's not unlimited. I mean, I mean, it's not unlimited. I, you know, if you're dealing with a three hundred million dollar fund, you're dealing with a three hundred million dollar yeah, fund. Yeah, I mean, I, we just spoke, but like, there's all these great ideas. Like, like yesterday, uh, I even see this pitch conversation, right? Mm -hmm. Seven people pitch, all are like, man, that's a great idea. That's a great idea, right? Yeah. Like, I, I have no idea how people, like people choose, right? I mean, I'm sure there's metrics and stuff, but like, it's, yeah. There's metrics. And you have to stay true to the metrics you know. And like, but of course, everyone has biases for and against stuff you know. I'm sure you know. But yeah, yeah. I just could not imagine, like, man, like, like, can you imagine, like, picking between carrying cancer or carrying something else or, <laughs> or AI or like. Facts. I remember going to an event with uh, Burke Center because they asked me to be a judge for their pitch competition. And there was 37 startups in this, in this space. Yeah. And I'm looking at these startups, I'm like, wow. And like course, these kids are in college. Yeah, and I all believe they all believe in it. They're dedicated. They all believe in it. Their ideas are phenomenal. Like, like they got like, they got ideas that are solving problems. You're like you don't you doing what? Like that that are helping people that have had strokes that are ultimately giving them like mental exercises to ultimately strengthen brain activity again. 
I'm like sitting here like. <laughs> so this is one of the best ideas I've ever heard, right? So I used to volunteer at Taft and Federal Way for okay. my attorney, right? And one time they were doing a, some kind of pitch competition. So I was eighth grader, right? Three females, right? They got up and, it, and our, their idea was to charge your battery to use electricity out of your body, right? Oh. We're like, oh, shit. That's infinite energy. <laughs> yeah. We're like, oh, shit. But unfortunately, like, two of them parents did some, like, had a, something, they had a lot of personal problems. They couldn't go through it, right? Okay. They were like, I'll never forget that idea, right? Like, that's a good idea. That's like, a very like, good we're, idea. Like, we're all like, oh, shit. Because you have to harness the energy and it has, it has to be extracted. And yeah. From and they had, like, of course, no way to execute it, I don't think, but they, they had a plan, right? I think they, they, they had it broken down, like, oh, shit. Like, you don't realize you, got, you might have something here, right? Well, remember this. All ideas start off as ugly ideas. Mm -hmm. All ideas are ugly. Like, and then it's just more so in the sense that the more that you work it out, the more that it blossoms mm -hmm. from ugly duckling to, like, literally becoming a beautiful. And so, you know, I always tell people that, like, you know, we hear so many ideas. And sometimes the ideas that may not even make sense to us, it's like... I'm like, okay, give yourself some time to, like, just think about it. I mean, back in the day, you know, who in the world would say, yeah, I want some random stranger to spend the night in my house? <laughs> I get you to get the fuck out of here. And then next thing you know, Airbnb. Like, it's crazy. Yeah. You know, back in the day, so you want me to get some random dude's car and have him drive me somewhere that I don't know? Uber. Yeah. I mean, and well, no crazy ideas that come out now. There's, there's quite a few. There's quite a few. You, you never know, like, yeah. you know, there may be... There may be an application in which that, you know, say, for example, we can gather data from individuals and be able to help them decipher what, what, what they should study. Okay. Like, and then from there, give them a pathway as it pertains to, like, hey, like, kind of like gamifying. Yeah. I think one challenge we have is as a lot of parents, like, I think a lot of kids are very entrepreneurial. Yeah. But I think parents that like, kind of discourage it, you know. Well, yeah, because life goggles. We put on we put on all these life goggles. Like, like ha have you heard of Kali's Lemonade? Yes. Yeah. Like she's 13 years old, like killing it. Killing it. <laughs> Imagine your parents or someone to say, no, you can't do this, you know, or or like put up roadblocks. Well, I mean, the thing is, is like you can always tell, like when people uh, when when life has made them jaded, then they be they pass on. So somewhere like Kali. Should she even go to school? Like, if she chooses to. I mean, of course, she needs basic knowledge and stuff, but like, if she chooses to. Yeah. I mean, you know, you never know. She may go to college and ultimately find another way to ultimately scale up the company. Yeah. Like, oh man, I learned this in, yeah. in business or in marketing. But well, can you imagine, like, folks in college going to business class, some random instructor, and she's like, dude, I raised like blah, 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 you know, this book is bullshit. I already know it's bound to happen. I think it's going to happen even, and we're going to hear about a story like this in, from a kid in high school. A kid in high school, instead of doing the typical extracurriculars, by the time when they graduate and they walk across the stage, they're going to be worth $100 million. Yeah. Because of an idea that they created. Yeah. And I have a feeling that it's going to be something that involves high school. Yeah. So are you like um, positive or negative about the future? Positive. Positive. You got Why? It. Why? It's hope. hope. I mean, you know, hope that essentially that we can always be better than, you know, Better than the day that we fell asleep yesterday and wake up tomorrow with an opportunity to be better. You know, kind of goes back to the be remarkable. There's always opportunity for us to be better. Um, and I believe that as catharsis, as humans, yeah. you know, we always want to do, we always want to do right when it comes down to it. Like, yeah, we want to I do what's that. right. Now, there's, like I said, there's your few exceptions out there, but yeah. in the grand scheme of things, we want to do what's right. So AI, like the United States and China are like two big countries for AI right now, right? Yeah. Is there like another country out there that no India. one is? India. India is the other one? Okay. If nobody's paying attention to India. India though, but... is India. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't really matter who wins this like so-called AI race. Um, I think it's more so in the sense of whoever quote unquote wins or like literally like dominates the space so well that essentially they get to write the rules. Like that's what it comes down to. Who gets to write the rules? Like, for example, once upon a time, I invested in a company that was a drone company. And their focus was they didn't make drones. They made the fail-safe technology for drones to make them safer for people to fly over. And the reason why I invested in it because of the fact that I was like, okay, hey, if they get this shit right, then 
they can literally write the rules to FAA yeah. for drones. And then once they do that, well, somebody's going to come in and buy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and so that's ultimately how I thought about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's the mindset that we have to have when it comes to like, okay, hey, like, whoever's the leader will write the rules for everybody else who follows. So I also don't name the company, but is there a company you invested in? And you're like, okay, I fucked this one up. I I I shouldn't invest in this company. Okay. <laughs> and we need to we need to realize that you made a mistake. When I got the call that I found out that this person was uh involved in a uh specific type of sexual assault <laughs> or sexual Oops. harassment. Oops. And uh yeah. Okay. And I was just like, Yeah, this is this is a no for me. <laughs> you're like, yeah. I, I'm out. Like yeah. I, we need to figure out either they need to be removed or um, we're, we're going to pull. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, think what else? Um, we've, we covered a lot so far. Um, anything else? Anything I asked you? Anything I didn't ask you? I should have asked you. Anything else you want to talk about? Let's talk about my unfold. <laughs> okay. Let's talk okay. about it. Okay. Oh, I have to ask you. Okay. What do you want? Okay. <laughs> so my unfold, where did that idea come from? Don't know what big backtrack, right? So this guy reached out to me maybe a month ago, right? Uh -huh. And I met him last night. Okay. So he's he used to work for Lock, Lockheed Martin. Okay. He would actually he would like code the the um, the, um, the systems in the air in the fighter jets, right? Yep. And so he had a bad experience uh, with job search, right? So he wants to like fix job search, right? Yep. I said, dude, I want to discourage you, but man, everyone's trying to solve this problem. No one solved it, right? So I talked to him to the world. It was it was funny. Yes, one of the people pitching. Their startup is like to do recruiting for designers. Mm -hmm. I said, dude, I told you everyone's trying to solve this problem, right? I'm saying mm -hmm. I'm not discouraging you from trying to problem solve this, but you realize everyone's trying to fix it, right? Yep. And you did kind of the same thing with my unfold. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't discourage him from doing it though, because of the thing is, is like given that there's people still within the space that are trying to solve the problem, shows you that how viable it is. Just create humility.io, just like right. on and on and on. It's a it's a constant. People will forever need jobs. And as like but I will say this, you know, people don't think about like, even I didn't think about it at the time. People don't think about it from a standpoint of generation, like how generational it is in the sense of like, okay, hey, that these are generational challenges. And if you look at it from a generational challenge, then maybe you may solve it. Yeah. If you don't look at it from a general, uh, from a, like a, a generational problem, then you're going to fall into the ether of everybody else who's yeah. doing the same exact thing. Like, think about it. Like, if we really look at it, Fiverr and Upwork, those are those are recruitment platforms. Yeah, you're right. They are. And they are massively successful. Yep. LinkedIn has been around forever. Look who's not here anymore. Like, you know, or still around, but not really around. Monster and D yep. and all those other mm -hmm. folks. They're still around, but they're not really. They're like, they're like the MySpace recruiting platform. Exactly. And, you know, Monster, you know, got acquired by Randstad, Swedish company, and then ultimately, like, Things just kind of like, yeah. I don't know. It just went off the rails from there. But also the the demographic, the market changed. So again, it's like if you look at things from a generational standpoint, though, you know, a lot of the platforms haven't really stepped up into the new generation. I mean, ZipRecruiter is still the same platform, right? Yep. And then it's like you got platforms like Handshake, which is dedicated towards college students. But even then, it's just like, eh. So again, it's like there's opportunity within the space, but like like I said, nobody really thinks to like how they're solving that problem. If I can go back in time, man. So this is my take. This is my opinion, right? I think the reason you can't fix it because a hiring manager, right? Mm. Because like hiring manager, my tele recruiter, I need a left-handed, red-headed, six foot two who can code Python, right? Yeah. The recruiter found him ten great candidates. Oh, I changed my mind. I need someone else now, right? Yeah. So I think that, I, I mean, me personally, I blame hiring managers. I would say the route that people should take instead of going for like the massive companies that are already indoctrinated, they should go towards the companies that are like Series A, Series B, that are still trying to figure out their HR, they're still, but they, they drastically need to recruit. Yeah. So companies that have just scored massive amounts of dollars, you know, in fundraising, like those should be your clients. Those should be your customers. Also, people mess up recruiting. They like obviously had to recruit tech people differently from plumbers. Yep. Different from policemen. Like yep. you have to recruit people differently, right? Yep. So 
again, it's, you know, if I could go back in time and change it, I would have thought generational. If I could, if yeah. I had the, the mind capacity of thinking the, like, what's the, generational? The time portal. Yeah, if I can go back in a time portal and just like literally step back in and be like, all right, oh yeah, I would totally change it like this. And this would have like literally solved significant amounts of problems. And my uncle, wasn't like your second or third startup you did? That was my third startup. Third startup, okay. Third startup. All right. I mean, I, I've had some doozies before then. <laughs> like, I actually, no, that, if I'm like literally putting it all into perspective, then that would be considered my fifth or my okay. sixth. Okay. Because Urban Tech Systems, that was technically a startup mm -hmm. that I came on board to. Yeah. And that that did well. Um, <laughs> My first ever business. Because Urban Tech, that pretty much paid your bills for a while. It right? paid my bills. Yeah. Um, and then when I was 13, that was a fiesta del failure. Yeah. <laughs> I was the only one doing work. And my brother, who was my co-founder, yeah. was just like, ah, you got it. <laughs> you got it. You but got then it. when it came time to get paid, he was like, oh, well, what's up with the coin? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the beautiful part about it though, is each, each time it was literally like a stair step up. So by the time when I got to my unfold, of course, there was still a ton of shit that I needed to learn. There was a ton of mistakes, you know, because urban doing urban tech was completely different than yeah. doing my unfold urban tech. They were already having customers. They were just a different firm that we needed to transition from this firm and create a whole new firm. And then this is now the firm that literally does all that work. now. So that was different. My unfold was just. Oh, I got to create all this shit from the start. Yeah, <laughs> that like this is different, um, and I and I definitely struggled in the early innings there. I definitely struggled. How about this? I think a lot of star founders struggle. They think like, oh, I'm Jason Cadmus. Had this great idea. It was going to work for me. Uh, no, right? Like, talk about the skill set you need to convince people to come work for you. Basically, are free, right? I mean, you can say you have equity. Yeah, but but it's still free. Yeah, and to me, telling some of you, have, I'm gonna give you ten percent equity. I mean, that's the same as like me telling you the pot of gold and rainbows yours. That shit probably is not going to happen. Yeah. So, I mean, the biggest thing is that what normally loops founders in is just the fact that they understand one, the business. And so they understand like, okay, hey, this is the idea that we're building. And then two, the other part is, is like, okay, hey, people pay attention to like, okay, well, what are you doing now to execute? And they can easily see like, okay, hey, that you need their help. But it's just like, okay, hey, well, where do I fit? Like showing them how do they fit into the yeah. into the landscape of things. A lot of founders actually struggle there, and that's the reason why they they struggle to find founders. If they're lucky, they were just sitting there. They just happen to be sitting in the same room with somebody who wish that was knowledgeable, and they were like, "Okay, let's start this idea together." Like this just this just makes sense. Yeah. But other founders they struggle to find other founders because of the fact that they have this idea and it becomes like their baby, and then it's like you expect the same person to be exactly like, "Oh." <laughs> no, it Gung ho don't work like that. And it doesn't work like that. Like you're like they're walking into something that you've already started. Mm -hmm. Like and now it's like they're they're going to get it. But then also it's like the other parts of that is where founder struggle is now that they're a part they're in this game with you. You also have to be able to kind of like, OK, it's no longer just mine. Yeah. It's it becomes mine becomes ours. Yeah. And how does that transition? Lord. <laughs> So how about the pro so there's a lot of what's what called there's a lot of one entrepreneurs out there, right? Yes. How do you convince them like to I won't say stop what they're doing, but like how do you like how do you stop that? I don't know really a good question, but I mean the, the data shows it. The data shows it. Okay. Like if you've gone through X amount of pivots over a period of time, then ultimately you need to start asking yourself the question, is this really working? You know, if you're showing that okay, hey, that you're not getting past the ceiling and you made X amount of pivots and the market still isn't responding towards it, then maybe you need to face the music and say, it's time to close it up. Okay. Yeah. So what, what's the number one lesson you learned from your time with my UFO? Jesus. Uh, the number one lesson? Or you do top 10 if you want to. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do, I'll, I'll find one. I'll find one. That's, that's, that's massive. Um, let's see here. The number one lesson that I have learned is um early on the early on lesson that i learned was you got to be able to trust your team if you can't trust your team then essentially you will never go far and you'll ultimately handicap your team and it grows and it, it will grow like a cancer 
And then how do you make sure you pass that knowledge on to your current founders you're mentoring? Oh, like literally just in the sense of always putting them in exercises when they're working with founders, like, okay, hey, like always asking like, okay, hey, well, what does so-and-so think? Or, you know, putting them in a position where it's like, you think about like, okay, hey, this is, it's not just a me thing. You know, of course, people over, people sometimes take the CEO role and blow it at way out of proportion. Of course, it, it carries, it definitely carries its responsibilities, but it's not the only responsibility. And a CEO is only as good as the people that are ultimately surrounding them, that ultimately help them um, build a business. And how, for the founders you, you in your, your in FTC, how often do they interact with, with each other? The founders, like within their own companies? No, we're like, yeah, within FTC, how often do your founders interact with each other? So our founders in FTC don't really interact with other founders. Okay. Uh, they're more so focused on their own company. Okay. Um, I think the summit event will be probably like the first time where a lot of the founders get to meet the other founders. Okay. Um, but the founders also interact with a lot of the FTC partners Okay. at any point in time. And so the summit, are you, is there be like, like like a room with all your startups in there so that doing like a... Um tables and stuff and i don't know <laughs> i don't know Not like there may be a surprise there okay okay <laughs> okay so i'm going the right direction okay yeah, look i don't okay. know okay. Uh, you never know what could you never know what could possibly happen okay nice um so anything else you want to talk about anything else i should ask you um are your dallas cowboys gonna actually win the title this no. year okay no i'm a fan but i'm realistic right like that <laughs> Like Jerry Jones, all in, like all in. I guess mean all in means we're signing some random free agent linebacker. I know? was gonna say all in means more so in the sense of let's get some tickets sold. <laughs> let's go. Yeah, let's, what about the brand for the Jones? Let's start the marketing team. machine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can't you can't deny his marketing machine. And look, listen, this man writes the book on marketing for mm -hmm. sure. Like it, like showing like how is it that you can like literally carry the glory days of the '90s and people still feel it in 2024. I, mean, I don't know they how stay, that's possible. They stay in the news. It could be like I think that they also do it like like clockwork too. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> they do it like clockwork. Oh yeah. They just do this massive push of like just information. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's something that should be studied. <laughs> oh yeah, he's a master at it, right? It, it should be studied. Now, I don't know. I, uh, my Patriots, on the other hand, we look. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, I mean, it's cold days past Tom, post Tom Brady. Yeah, yeah. Y'all be okay though, because I want there's a tiny to play for Dallas. I'm thinking his name. He left Dallas time with Houston, right? Uh -huh. And he was like, he said, like, man, I'm glad I'm in Houston to focus on football. What do you mean? Yeah. He, he was like, yeah, in Dallas, we have practice. And like, he's like, tourists just go through the practice facility, right? He's like, he's like, it's like we're with monkeys in a cage. Like, they would like do tours of them practicing. Oh, no. Yeah. No, nah, I'm good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm good. Yeah. Houston is the better, better spot for me. Yeah. Yeah. Houston should be good. The only thing with Houston is that they have a first place schedule now. So, Versus the last year, the last look, schedule. man. I, I don't put nothing past anything now. Like you can have the best schedule, and then next thing you know, that injury bug or whatever yeah, else hits, and then a, t a team comes out of nowhere that was yeah. unexpected. My thing, the Cowboys, all in, did nothing. The Eagles signed Shakon Saquon Bark. Have you said his Barkley. name right? Vastly improved their team. Well, vastly improved as long as he stays healthy. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's if he true. if he's no longer healthy, it's yeah. Ah, it's over. And my thing is like with well, Kansas City, they won the Super Bowl with no receivers. They got receivers now. So it's always weird when a when a team gets weapons. Yeah. You're like, oh man, they got all these massive weapons and then they don't do as well. Yeah, it's true too. Yeah. So they got Marquise uh Brown. Yeah. He's fast. He's really done nothing so far in NFL as far as I know. Marquise Brown, that's Hollywood Brown. Yeah, right? Hollywood Brown. Yeah, but he doesn't catch the ball though. He like he struggles to catch the ball. Yeah. And Xavier Ward from Texas, like he wasn't the best receiver in Texas, you know. So I don't know. Who knows? It might be who knows, but I don't know. If it's ever Dallas and the Patriots in the Super Bowl, <laughs> we gotta go. Yeah. We gotta go. Definitely, definitely. Um we're gonna wrap this up real fast. Um, can you share your social media so people can reach out to you? Yeah, so you can find me at I am Mark Monroe uh on Twitter, Instagram, and I guess you can find me on LinkedIn by just searching Mark Monroe, or it's I guess my tag is like I think it's I am Mark Monroe as well. So yeah, I think I'm, that, I am Mark Monroe. Is the best way for people to is like so one you like you're on all the time or like I'm on Twitter a lot more often. I don't really use Instagram like that, but you know, I'll respond if I see messages there. LinkedIn, if if 
you're always wanting to talk business with me. I'm always available. I don't really shun anybody away. Even if it means that it's a no, I'm still yeah. going to give advice. Um, you're, you gave us a lot of good, good, good value, but can you give us any last minute advice or wisdom or anything you want to talk about? Um, one of the things that I've learned and it's been like this constant thing um, throughout my life and my career, and it's just a quote that is just like, it just kind of started sticking with me during the pandemic and after I had some time for real self-reflection. And it's just pretty much never let your cockiness supersede your talent. <laughs> Don't let your cockiness supersede your talent. <laughs> That's fucking good. I mean, you know, Damn. when I was trading in college, my first trade ever, um, I traded with $1,500. Now in 2004, $1,500 was a lot of money <laughs> to a, for, for a freshman at Tuskegee in Alabama. And um, I did the trade, and the trade went to 4500 4, And I was like, okay, I'll just let it ride. You know, I got this. Like, this is easy, right? You know, professor said all things about risk, and I was like, you know what? Screw your risk. I, I just, I'm up. Come back two days later, position's at zero. And then it's like I've, I've, I've had multiple losses like that, you know, over the course period of time. You know, I took an $18 million loss in 2018. 2022 was ridiculous. Um, but at the same time, it's like one of the things that I've realized is that sometimes my cockiness is just the fact that I just like, okay, it'll be fine. I got this. And then reality is just like, reality comes by and is like, huh, really? Yeah. Hold my beer. Um, and it's just like one of the things that I've learned is just like, just never let your cockiness supersede your talent. We see it across athletes and sports where their cockiness supersedes their talent and then ultimately they're cut. Um, we see it in tech or in companies all the time where like, you know, they got too cocky, they got complacent and then somebody came up and like literally took their lunch. So again, just the best advice that I can give is like, just out of all the things that I said, if you never heard anything else, it's never let your cockiness supersede your talent. Mark, thanks for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.